we'll be able to see um, good scenery from both sides of the aircraft because we're, we're going to move around here quite a bit. Mount Erebus, which is now coming up very rapidly on the left hand side, is at just over 13,000 feet. The, the actual crater is about two and a half miles across. No, you're forcing it, Murray. Now, if you lift it in the bobbles, you're going to stop short every time. So just roll it smooth this time, OK? Just a time. Mr. David! What? It's been four hours since any contact. At 16.25, 901 was due at latitude 60 degrees south. At that point, it should have switched from McMurdo air traffic control back to New Zealand. It's possible the plane has lost all on-board communication, in which case the first we'll see or hear of them is when they come within range of Dunedin radar. When will that be? Dunedin radar has a range of two degrees, which takes us down to here. 901 ought to be within range of that radar by 18.30 hours. That's half an hour from now. Until then, we keep all frequencies open, alert all aircraft in the area, keep in touch with search and rescue at McMurdo, and hope like hell that phone rings. Bruce, how's it going? Not good. How do we cover that vast bloody ocean? And so, it's over to Murray Davis, Chief Executive of Air New Zealand, co-sponsors of the Open. Murray. Thank you, uh, Bernie. For the last 40 years, uh, we at Air New Zealand have taken our responsibilities as one of New Zealand's largest corporate entities uh, seriously. We've always uh, felt a sense of obligation uh, to contribute towards New Zealand's uh, sporting and cultural development. And we have great pleasure in continuing that tradition now. Nothing that would take out all the onboard communication systems for this long. And leave the aircraft still able to fly. Upgrade to distress phase. When does the fuel run out? 9.30. Don't have to sit school seeing it tomorrow. Down in study, Catherine, you'll be fine. A nice early night. Can't we start with, Dad? 
Hello, Maria Collins. Yes, it's uh, David Eden, Director of Flight Operations, Mrs. Collins. I'm um, just ringing to let you know that there's been a problem with Jim's flight. Um, Jim's been out of radio contact for some time now, since about uh, 2 p.m. in fact. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that, and uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know any more. But if you're on your own, it might be an idea if you get someone to come and sit with you. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't. The police come round even for a road accident. Mum, what's the matter? Mum. Hello? It's Mrs. Casson here, my husband's first officer on flight 901. I've just had a call from a Captain Eden saying that the aircraft is overdue. Could you confirm that? Mr. Davis. DC-10 on a sightseeing flight over the Antarctic. Sources within Air New Zealand confirm that there has been no radio contact with the plane for some hours, and it's believed the plane will be out of fuel by 9.30 tonight. Air New Zealand says there was no immediate concern because there had been a solar flash... Mr. Davis, we've just heard. Can we have a reaction? Or electrical disturbance. Jim, get this bum out of here. here. How do you feel, sir? How the hell do you think I feel? Davis, out! Now get out! Muslim students occupying the United States Embassy in... Mr. Davis, it's the Prime Minister's office. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great regret that we must accept that the aircraft is overdue. Come on, Craig. Haven't you got something new? The aircraft carries extensive life support equipment. So in the event of in something the like... Mr. Craig, Mr. where's Mr. Warren? Where's the executive going to say something? Mr. Davis has been down in Wellington. He's on his way here now. He'll be making a statement in the boardroom as soon as he arrives. When did you back? Where's Warren going? Reserves exhausted. Cape Hannett, latitude 72.20. Check 72.20. Longitude 170.13. Check 170.13. McMurdo, latitude 77.53. Check 77.53. Longitude 164.48. Check. No, again. 164.48. 166.58. more than two degrees difference. It's nearly 30 miles. Brian Hewitt, who is it? Uh, Alan Dorday here, Mr. Hewitt, flight dispatch. What do you want? Uh, we've discovered a two degree error in 901's destination waypoint at McMurdo. It's not two degrees, it's an update of 2.1 miles. We put it in last night. And it's no concern of flight dispatch anyway. Is it true, Mr. Davis, the delegates to the 10th Antarctic Treaty meeting six weeks ago warned member governments to discourage sightseeing flights to the Antarctic because of the danger? Are you saying they know more about flying than we do? What's your reaction, Mr. Davis, to Air New Zealand's first loss of a commercial flight? Well, that question makes me sick. We're terrified. These are the kind of circumstances that 
kill us all. It's appalling. has announced that the wreckage of Flight 901 has been found on the flanks of Mount Erebus, a 13,000-foot volcano in Antarctica. The indications are that there are no survivors of the 257 passengers or crew. And just repeating that news, Air New Zealand has announced that the wreckage of Flight 901 has been found in Antarctica. Seven people have died, but those figures alone do not indicate the depth of the tragedy for New Zealand. The ripples spread through a small society and touch almost everybody. There's an immediate tide of public sympathy for the bereaved, and also for the airline. After the first reaction of sympathy, there's another. How did it happen? Ron Chippendale, the Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, will be the first to answer that question. He will be assisted at the crash site by Air New Zealand's chief pilot, Ian Gemmell. Already in the navigation section of Air New Zealand, the question of cause is being addressed. Keith Amies is an authority on the sophisticated inertial navigation system that guides the DC-10. He's been unable to sleep since he was telephoned during the night. Amy's calls up the flight plan for the previous week's flight and looks particularly for the McMurdo coordinates. From these figures, he plots the route taken by that flight down McMurdo Sound. He then calls up Collins flight plan to compare it with the previous weeks. His worst fears are confirmed. The destination coordinates are different. When he plots these coordinates, they take the route on a direct line over Mount Erebus. Keith, you got a paper? Did you speak to Hewitt? The error wasn't in 901's flight plan. Eh? The update on Jim's flight plan corrected an error. It's been in the computer for God knows how long. I don't understand. His flight plan was a route over Erebus to the tech end. Previous flights seem to have taken them straight down McMurdo Sound. Hell, which one was Jim Collins briefed on? Still unanswered are questions as to how far and how quickly news of this discovery traveled. There is no explanation as yet why TE-901 was found well below its designated minimum altitude. The wreckage was sighted at 2,500 feet. The minimum altitude prescribed in the briefing is 6,000 feet. Mr. Davis, are you saying that the pilot had taken the plane too low? I cannot comment further than that. 
Do you think the compasses were thrown out of alignment by the magnetic fields of the South Pole? You're talking about the old DC-3 days. The DC-10 is fitted with uh, an inertial navigation system which is the most sophisticated on any commercial airliner operating in the world today. No mention of the change coordinates. And it will tell you within yards exactly where you are. Four days after the disaster, the black box flight recorder and the cockpit voice recorder are recovered intact from the crash site. In the absence of witnesses, they will provide precious clues to the last moments of Flight 901. On the 4th of December, Chief Pilot Ian Gemmell returns to Air New Zealand headquarters with an eyewitness account of the crash site. All three engines were still delivering considerable power at impact. The engines never broke away prior to impact, neither did the wings. So it doesn't appear to have been caused by any major structural or engine failure? Nope. So the DC-10 is in the clear? I think so. What does the Chief Inspector think? I briefed him before I left the ice. He agrees. At this stage. It is not known whether the change coordinates are discussed at this meeting. But later that afternoon, Gemmell does discuss them with Air New Zealand's in-house committee of inquiry which has been charged with putting together a file on Flight 901 for the Chief Inspector of Air Accidents. Gemmell then goes on to brief a team of three experts, which is to fly out to the United States that night to transcribe the cockpit voice tape. Although by this time Gemmell, Eden and Johnson almost certainly know about the change of coordinates, that potentially vital information is not passed on to the transcribing team. The following day, the chief executive reports to the full board for the first time. 901 appears to have hit Mount Erebus at about 1,400 feet. And that appears to be off course. Considerably. The aeroplane was apparently attempting to descend into clearer air, but was left of center. Collins was one of our most proficient commanders. I can't think why he got into this position. Were all the navigational systems functional? As far as we can tell, Des, yes. Deputy Chairman Des Dalgetty. Well, we must watch out for the post-mortem syndrome. Everything we say and do is under scrutiny. There'll be lawyers from the US and here looking for information, so we must protect ourselves. Des has suggested Lloyd Brown QC and David Williams as counsel. They're the best combination of heavyweights I can think of. They'll do the job. Well, perhaps you could instruct them on our behalf. Uh, I've uh, taken the liberty of instructing them already, Bill, uh, on behalf of the board. And I've advised the Prime Minister. Again, there is no mention of the change coordinates. Now then, when does the Chief Inspector visit us? The conduct of the police team and the face rescue team is beyond praise. The conditions on the crash site were harrowing in the extreme. Uh, Chief Inspector, I understand the skewer goals... Were... Which I'm sure you people have the good taste not to want to delve into. A rumour has it, Inspector, that the cause of the disaster is already known. That's news to me. Wasn't the pilot too low? Nothing has been decided. Uh, Mr Chippendale, have you seen this? London Sunday Times says that the last three messages received from the plane overwhelmingly suggest that Captain Collins and his crew misjudged their position. Are you saying that's wrong? I'm saying it's disappointing to see that kind of thing in print before the matter has been fully investigated. Mr. On the 13th of December, the Chief Inspector arrives at Air New Zealand headquarters to continue his inquiries. Chippendale's interviews of Air New Zealand's flight personnel and pilots will comprise the major part of his investigation. At the end of it, he will find no evidence to suggest the crew were misled by the change coordinates. And he will conclude that the change played no part in causing the disaster. Meanwhile, the board meets with Lloyd Brown and David Williams, counsel for Air New Zealand. Here it is. What exactly, Maureen? It's the file for Chippendale. A comprehensive file of papers and documents relating to the accident and other Antarctic flights was tabled by the chief executive. Thank you, Des. 
put together by our in-house inquiry. We don't need that. We've got to be careful, Murray. That's right. We can't be sure at this stage what's discoverable or by whom. That file shall be noted or stamped in such a way as to carry their confidentiality to the company and to avoid court-ordered discovery. It is also vital that no conclusions be recorded in any reports. We advise them not to do that. Who? The in-house committee. We told them not to reach any conclusions, just to prepare the file. I see. Bill, if any of this got to court, we can be ordered to make our reports and conclusions available to the opposition. And we'd be held to them. As Christmas approaches, the chief executive is looking to Air New Zealand's future, trying to put the worst of the trauma behind his troubled company. But some of the line pilots are becoming alarmed at what they perceive to be management's push towards blaming Collins and his crew for the disaster. Well, Maria. Mr. Davison. We, um, we haven't got too much between us, Maria, have we? Haven't we? I just wanted to say that uh, I think you've all been terribly brave. I think you should know that. You've suffered personally, I know. But we're a corporate family. There is a need for all of us to put this terrible tragedy behind us. Accept it. Put it behind us. Share the responsibility of making the future a success. Success. You've all been brave. Keep it up. The toe, Peter? Like one who loves the games he has amassed and meets the hour when he must lose his boot. But first, the good oil. Take him, Lindsay. The owner? Mr. Brown? Nice. How's tricks? Bowling along. Bowling along. You ready for that job yet? The time cometh, Vance. Just a few loose ends to tidy up first. It'll keep. When are you ready? How's the lad? How do you think he'll go? Well, he's a big bone fella, you know. Slow developer. I think he'll be stronger in the spring. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Lance. Best keep our loot in our pockets, then. All the best, Your Honor. When you want that job. Just give me the number. There's something so much more satisfying about Luke going through risk and sheer cunning. One can feel a certain empathy with the criminal mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Robert Muldoon, will now make the presentation in front of the member stand. At odds like that, I wish I'd had the balance of payments deficit on your filly. <laughs> this job Lance kept offering you, Peter? Oh, a certain literary endeavor Lance and I have been discussing for some years. In February 1980, stories of the change coordinates begin to surface in the press. Who's leaking this damn stuff? got to have come from the pilots. Well, it's got to be stopped, damn it. It's bloody disloyal. Well, we'll look into it, Murray. What are we going to say? Say nothing. It's damaging, damn it. Something's got to be said. Examination of the computerized flight plan records and information made available from the aircraft's navigation computer equipment recovered from the site confirms that the correct coordinates were fed into the navigation system. That is all. 
Wasn't it changed the night before, Mr. Davis? Tell the board! Put the crouton of the change, Mr. Davis! Put your heads in towards a public inquiry! Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, I'd like to ask if there are As any the first numbing shock of the tragedy gives way to cooler assessments, lawyers acting for the estates of victims of the disaster gather in Auckland to listen to an American attorney. I'd like now to introduce the man who fought the insurers in the Paris air crash and won, Jerry Stearns. Meanwhile, Peter Martin, who acts for the aviation insurance syndicates under the Lloyds umbrella, has flown from London to meet with Air New Zealand. There is a limit of $42,000 per passenger in terms of our liability. Mm. Unless it can be proved that your airline was grossly, willfully, recklessly negligent. I can assure you, Mr. Davis, that that is a tough standard of proof for any claimant to achieve. The insurers are concealed behind the skirts of the airline. While the airline desperately tries to rebuild its morale and public image, the insurer's overriding consideration is the restriction of the eventual payout. That gentleman is the bottom line. Question is, what happens if there is a public inquiry? How does that affect claims against us? In theory, since neither the evidence nor the findings of a public inquiry are admissible in later litigation, it has no effect. In theory? But in practice, mm. it can become a sort of test case, where they can throw mud and see which bits stick. And then use those against us in court at a later date? Precisely. At the end of Jerry Stern's speech, the lawyers for the victims' estates vote to form a consortium to present a united front against the insurers. Oh, one final word of warning, gentlemen. Air New Zealand may not be very experienced at this game, but it'll be getting a lot of advice from people who are. And Chippendale's report will have input, and strong input, from both Air New Zealand and your Civil Aviation Division. You cannot rely on it. You must press for an independent inquiry to determine cause. In early March, Chippendale's draft report is released to those involved. It contains minor criticisms of Air New Zealand and civil aviation, but directs the major blame elsewhere. Flying in cloud. Flying in cloud at 1,500 feet in mountainous terrain. Rubbish. I could understand it if Jim had done something minor, or forgotten to do something, sort of contributed. This is just stupid. They must think we're flying Cessnas. I've seen Chippendale's final draft, Arthur, and I reckon it's just a company line. Pilot error. But what about the coordinates? Uh, Chippendale said there was no evidence to suggest the pilot was misled by them. Rubbish. They were briefed on the other route. We know that. Yeah. Well, look, Maria can make submissions to Chippendale before he does his final report, but I reckon he's a lost cause. Now, we've got to go to the top. The Pilots Association's got to put pressure on the Attorney General for public inquiry. But the Attorney General, Jim McClay, is under pressure from many sides. He is invited to dinner at the Meridian Room of the South Pacific Hotel in Auckland. At dinner, McClay is urged not to allow a public inquiry into the cause of the disaster. He is told that any public inquiry would do grave damage to the airline. There's no option. On the 10th of March, four months after the crash, the Attorney General announces there will be a public commission of inquiry. Well, who's going to do the job? I think it's a matter for a High Court judge. And I think he should sit alone. Because I doubt if we could find anyone with real aviation expertise who hasn't at some stage been involved with either Air New Zealand or civil aviation. Eh, bit risky, isn't it? Leaving it all in the hands of one man? We'd have to be very particular about just who that man is. <laughs> oh, basta, basta, Antonio, grazie, grazie. Prego, signori. Ever thought of opening a restaurant, Lloyd? <laughs> Common fantasy of the middle classes who have never washed a dish in their lives. Can things be really that bad? Not bad, not bad, a bit oh, hum, humdrum. We need a change. Too much cops and robbers. Margarita. Oh, 
Margarita. Tito? Well, what is it? Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of New Zealand and her other realms and territories, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith, a warrant. To our trusty and well-beloved, the Honourable Peter Thomas Marne of Auckland, Judge of the High Court of New Zealand, greetings. It's Erebus. You're the Royal Commissioner. Reposing trust and confidence in my integrity, knowledge and ability. Now... You said it could be a political football. Nevertheless, I'm doing it. Good. The Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, Ron Chippendale, has just released his final report into the air of this disaster. The chilling last seconds in the lives of 257 people who died in the Air New Zealand DC-10 crash in the Antarctic are now known. The pilot bringing his aircraft thousands of feet too low, ignoring the mounting alarm of his flight engineers, uncertain of his position as the aircraft neared the icy slopes. A last too late. Much of the lasting bitterness of the Erebus aftermath can be traced to the government's decision to publish Chippendale's report before the public inquiry. And it is my firm belief that had the pilot observed the minimum altitude of 16,000 feet until over McMurdo, as he had been clearly briefed to do, then descended to a minimum altitude of 6,000 feet in the safety sector around McMurdo, the DC-10 would not have hit Erebus. Chippendale makes only minor criticisms of Air New Zealand and civil aviation. It is a highly satisfactory result for the Prime Minister, who, as Minister of Finance, is the chief shareholder in Air New Zealand. But publication of the report is a huge obstacle to the subsequent Royal Commission. Those who feel they've already been tried and cleared by the Chief Inspector do not welcome being tried again. While for those whose loved ones have been held culpable for the deaths of 257 people, the rebuttal of the report after such massive publicity seems a hopeless task. The damage has been done, Mr. Davison. I don't see much point in carrying on. Maybe in time, everyone will forget. Mrs. Collins, I know you're disappointed. But Marn is a judge with a reputation for cutting through to the truth. Give him a chance. And finally, Your Honor, it's my submission that Your Honor might well consider the principle of omnia praise umunta. Omnia praise. That the law will presume to, to be, be done that which has to be done by someone with a statutory duty to do it. Uh, that's the one, Your Honor. If I remember correctly, Mr. Harrison, you have tried once before to lead me down this particular garden path. Uh, yes, Your Honor. And how did I receive your Omnia Praise submission on that occasion? Do you recall? Uh, you were not particularly impressed with it, sir, as I recall. Nor am I on this occasion, Mr. Harrison. Appeal dismissed. Silence. Stand up, please. Mr. Harrison. Your Honor? Might I see you in chambers before you go? Go on in, Mr. Harrison. I won't be needing this for a while. Sit down, Gary. Now, as you may know, I have been appointed Royal Commissioner for the Erebus Inquiry. Uh, yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. David Baragwana will be senior counsel assisting me. I was wondering whether you might like to join us. <laughs> I'd be delighted, sir. Good. Good. It's hardly the sort of case for Omnia Praise in Monto Rita S. Actor, Gary, but uh, it should be interesting, nevertheless. Monday, the 7th of July, 1980. The Royal Commission into the Erebus disaster begins. Many see the commission as a formality, expecting Chippendale's report to be confirmed. That view seems to be shared by the government, which has given Mann just three months to hear the witnesses and write his report. Silence. Stand up, please. Mann, with a reputation for brevity and incisiveness, will seek three extensions of time 
hear over 50 witnesses and sift through 3,000 pages of evidence and nearly 300 exhibits before the inquiry will have run its course. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. I think it would be appropriate, given what we are here for, to observe one minute silence for 257 people who died most tragically barely nine months ago. The hearings and their aftermath will provide their own victims. The Royal Commissioner will be among them. Do you swear that the evidence you give... The Chief Inspector of Air Accidents will stand in the witness box before Mahan for eight days without flagging. His opinion will not change. <clears throat> Chief Inspector, would you agree that had Air New Zealand's instructions to the pilot in respect of minimum safe altitude and the descent in the safety sector been observed, this accident would not have happened? That is my belief. You made an allegation that Air New Zealand was in breach of Civil Aviation Regulation 77. Now that regulation requires, does it not, that the pilot in command has demonstrated to the airline that he has an adequate knowledge of certain matters. Correct. In what way do you suggest the crew should have demonstrated their adequate knowledge, other than by undergoing the required briefing? In some <clears throat> tangible form, perhaps a, a question and answer paper. How about a statutory declaration by each crew member that he had an adequate knowledge of the various items? I don't see that that would suit the purpose. So you prefer the question and answer? Yes, I do. And I remind you that we're dealing with professional pilots. Yes. Do you know of any airline which conducts a quiz session at the end of a briefing? I have not attended any such. Isn't the answer that you do not? To his knowledge. That is surely sufficient to answer your question. I have no wish to harp, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. McLaren. <coughs> Mr. Chippendale, uh, earlier this year, did you send to my client, Mrs. Casson, the widow of the first officer on 901, a copy of your draft report? I did. And did she then ring you and indicate to you that she desired to clear her husband's name as a pilot? That is correct. You will no doubt accept that that still remains her predominant concern? I would. You have said in your report that on 901's approach to the Erebus area, the surface visibility was good. Surface definition poor and horizon definition poor, with mountaintops covered in cloud. Is that a fair summary? I believe so. And in these circumstances, to use your own words, a high potential for whiteout exists. That is as I understand it. And the hazardous nature of whiteout when flying is, first, a loss of horizon perception. That is one of the effects. Secondly, disorientation and loss of references. Yes. Thirdly, a loss of distance perception. Yes. Fourthly, a loss of height perception. That is so. You've told us that the crew's demeanor was calm and confident up until seconds before the collision. That is my impression. And it is quite apparent, is it not, that nobody on the flight deck saw the mountain, subject to the six and a half seconds warning from the ground proximity warning system. I could detect no indication that they had sighted an obstruction. Would I be right in suggesting that, although you have indicated a probable cause of this accident, that that is not necessarily the only probable cause? This is correct. You would agree that an equally probable cause was the failure to brief the crew in a detailed fashion on whiteout, particularly as it could occur at low altitudes? This, I believe, may be a causal factor. The probable cause is the last event which happened in the sequence of the flight which made the accident inevitable. So the probable cause is the end event in a chain of prior events. This is the case. I take it that you're really saying that the probable cause is your definition of the immediate cause of what happened. This is so. There may have been, as I understand your view, some contributing causes which preceded the immediate cause. This is correct. I see. 
You mentioned in your report a helicopter pilot. He was flying over the slopes of Mount Erebus, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about 15 minutes after the accident time. That is correct. Those men who crewed that helicopter knew that if they looked to the south, there was Mount Erebus, didn't they? They knew that because they knew the locality in which they were placed. That is so. They were very familiar with the area. And despite being so familiar with the area, they were unable to see the elevated ground to the south, were they? I believe that that was the case. They were looking at something they knew was there, but they still couldn't see it. That is so. The cockpit voice recorder contains nothing which would suggest that the crew of Flight 901 ever did in fact see the slope, does it? I don't believe so. Now, my learned friend, Mr. McLaren, spoke to you about weather conditions on the approach to Erebus at the time. And you agree that a high potential for whiteout existed? Yes. So if you put those two together, weather conditions at the time and the cockpit voice recorder, which indicates the crew didn't see the slope, are you not driven to the conclusion that the whiteout deception occurred? I believe so. Well, Mr. Chippendale, if Captain Collins and his crew are flying visually, then they're relying upon the direct information they get through their eyes, aren't they? I think they... Is that right? I don't see that a one-word answer is going to fix that. I think, Mr. Davison, we will give Mr. Chippendale the lunch and the German to think about it. Don't shoot your bolt, lad. There's a way to go yet. What are you on to this afternoon? Fuck the voice recorder. Yes, good stuff, no doubt. I'd get him onto his last cause weakness and whiteout. Now, he appreciates as a purely technical matter what whiteout is, but he still thinks they should have seen the mountain. The man clearly lacks imagination. You say in your report that the probable cause of this accident was the decision of the captain to continue the flight at low level towards an area of poor surface and horizon definition. Now, just pausing there for a moment. Before the captain or any person can make a decision to continue, do they not have to know that ahead of them is an area of poor surface and horizon definition? Is that not logical? Putting it to you another way, perhaps. How can you make a decision upon something you don't know about? A decision is perhaps an ambiguously worded... The cause to which I was referring was that of the captain to continue flight at low level. If you look at the transcript of the Cockford voice recorder, Collins says, actually, those conditions don't look very good at all, do they? He then becomes apprehensive of the conditions ahead of him. He doesn't decide to continue on. He decides 44 seconds later to climb out of it. So where do you say that the captain decided to continue the flight at low level towards an area of poor surface and horizon definition? Well, he is already at 2,000 feet and decides to descend a further 500 feet. Was he at that stage aware that there was an area of poor surface and horizon definition ahead of him? You see, he didn't see the mountain, as you've already agreed. This is just the point. He didn't see anything. He went down a further 500 feet to see something. And I don't believe we will ever know whether, in fact, he comprehended that the area ahead of him was one of poor definition or believed it to be a continuation of the cloud base. I suggest to you, Mr. Chippendale, that your probable cause just doesn't hold up at all. The captain was aware of the poor conditions ahead of him only 44 seconds before he decided to climb out. And so instead of deciding to continue, as you suggest, he decided the exact opposite. He decided, in fact, to climb the aircraft out of the situation. I believe that my probable cause as it stands is reasonable. Your probable cause requires, though, that the pilot perceived in front of him an area of poor surface or horizon definition in order to give him the sort of knowledge that avoidance action needed to be taken. It is my belief he was confronted with such an area as I have just stated. But he needed to perceive it as such in order to decide whether or not to take evasive action, didn't he? If he was not immediately reassured by very clear perception of the terrain about him, he should have immediately vacated the area. I understood 
there was no indication from the pilot or the co-pilot on the cockpit voice recorder of not knowing where they were. The whole decision to switch the aircraft back to its computerized flight track after the descent indicates they didn't know where they were because that computerized track was taking them straight towards Mount Erebus. At 26 miles north of McMurdo, had he known where he was and had the navigation system been accurate, that would have put him almost on the side of the mountain. And he should have taken evasive action long before. You were saying he did not know where he was. Correct. You don't suggest, I assume, that Captain Collins would deliberately fly at 2,000 feet towards a mountain range of 10 or 12,000 feet. Correct. Uh, the Chief Inspector's report seemed to stand up reasonably well under cross-examination, despite his appalling practice of not requiring written signed statements from the people he interviewed. Davis, uh, Davison, Davison attacked him on what appeared to be his weakest point, his criticism of the pilot for not actually seeing an optical illusion. Chippendale's intransigence on Collins' inability to see optical illusions seems to beg larger questions. What was Collins doing at 1,500 feet if the minimum altitude for that side of the mountain was 16,000 feet? And why did Collins and his crew, flying one of the most sophisticated aircraft ever built, seem not to know where they were? Peter? Peter? Das Tuttle Casper. What did he get you up so early? I spied him lurking in the koai, looking lasciviously at the tui. I have explained to this fellow many, many times that I have no objection whatever to your pursuit of the sparrow, the blackbird, the starling, or even the old thrush but I will not brook your attempts to <laughs> throttle a song in that tree. That fellow is a cat, Peter. Besides, you can't see the koi from the bedroom. It's the thrill of the chase. Oh. I couldn't sleep. Mm. Nine months after the Erebus tragedy, the Civil Aviation Division of the Ministry of Transport begins its evidence. Civil Aviation is the government agency responsible for regulating Air New Zealand's operations. And it is the relationship between Civil Aviation and Air New Zealand which will intrigue the Commission. Are we ready to go? Just a moment we will be. Whereas Air New Zealand is protected by a $42,000 liability limit per passenger unless grossly negligent, Civil Aviation's liability is unlimited on any standard of negligence. This liability is of particular interest to John Henry and Colin Nicholson, counsel for the Consortium of Victims' Estates. Every expert we've spoken to, Air Force, Navy or civilian, is flabbergasted when we tell the man New Zealand was sending pilots to the Antarctic who'd never flown down there before. Right. Well, that's where we start. Why did civil aviation allow Air New Zealand to do that? Silence. Stand up, please. If Henry and Nicholson can find a chink in civil aviation's armor, the estates of those who perished on Erebus might benefit immeasurably. Mr. Morris. Thank you, Your Honor. I call Eric James Ormondson, control of airline operations. Mr. Ormondson, there was a requirement that a pilot in command should first have a flight under supervision down to the Antarctic. What was the reason for that requirement? The reason was so the pilot could become familiar with the operation. Did you regard it as a prudent requirement in 1978? I regarded it as a valuable experience. And a prudent requirement? Yes, it would be a prudent requirement. Meaning it was necessary for 78? Desirable. Is it not desirable then for 1979? Yes, it would be desirable. Prudent? Yes, I must agree it would be prudent. But I wouldn't agree because it was not required in 1979 that it was imprudent. 
If it was prudent in 79, why delete it? Because the company said they could not comply with it in 1979. Well, what was the reason Air New Zealand gave you to establish that they could not comply with the requirement in 1979? I don't recall they gave a reason. Is the situation that Air New Zealand's proposal would be treated by you as being satisfactory merely because it's put forward? You made that statement. I wouldn't agree with it. Now, civil aviation is also responsible for approving Air New Zealand's briefing material. Can you indicate any document in this briefing material which gives the pilot adequate knowledge of the dangers of whiteout? No, I can't. So you still hold to the view that nothing more than is recorded in the briefing material is desirable for pilots flying into the Antarctic? No, I couldn't make that statement. Now, what information is there now available, Mr. Amundsen, which was not available to your division prior to the 79 flights? Well, the information that's been presented here on the phenomenon of uh, whiteout. The material on whiteout would clearly be available to civil aviation from the New Zealand Meteorological Services, would it not? Are you aware of any inquiry that civil aviation made to them for further information on this topic? Other than my own inquiries, no. Am I right in thinking the Meteorological Service is a part of the Ministry of Transport? It is. And civil aviation is also part of the Ministry of Transport, isn't it? It is. And it is quite clear, therefore, that the information was available to your division, wasn't it? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Amundsen. No further questions? About the selection of the route, Mr. Amundsen, suppose you had got in touch with the U.S. Air Traffic Control Commander at McMurdo and said, it is proposed to fly in DC-10 aircraft at the same altitude as your military aircraft. But whereas your aircraft approach from the northwest, ours will approach from the north. And whereas your aircraft will be permanently on your radar screen for 40 miles out, ours are going to disappear behind the mountain 40 miles out. In addition, your VHF radio contact with our aircraft will also disappear at 40 miles out. What view do you think the officer in charge of the U.S. Navy at McMurdo would have taken of such a proposal. I believe the U.S. Navy would be aware of the situation. That means, does it not, that if the air traffic controller at McMurdo had a U.S. Navy starlifter approaching from the northwest somewhat in front of the arrival of an Air New Zealand DC-10, both are traveling at 16,000 feet and converging, are they not? Yes, they would be converging. They would the air traffic controller not have to say to the starlifter, you are on a converging course with an aircraft which I cannot get on my radar screen and cannot speak to on VHF radio. What would you think of such a proposal if you were the US Navy commander? Captain Spence, you were responsible in civil aviation for monitoring the Antarctic operation. Now, when Air New Zealand came up with this direct route over Erebus, did it not occur to you to suggest that matters would be safer if the route were moved 20 miles or so further west to McMurdo Sound to follow the safer military route? If the company can prove to us that there's adequate terrain clearance on the route, I have very little choice over which route it wishes to fly. Did you not wonder why Air New Zealand had seen fit to depart from the military route down McMurdo Sound? I did not query this. I'm trying to find some reason, Captain, for civil aviation's failure to suggest to Air New Zealand that they shift the route a bit further west to follow the military route down the Sound. Captain Spence, do you really think it possible that Captain Collins flew at 1,500 feet, 26 miles out from McMurdo, knowing Erebus was directly in front of him? Captain Collins should never have been at 1,500 feet. Just answer my question. Do you think it possible that he would have flown at 1,500 feet, 26 miles out from McMurdo when he knew Erebus was directly in front of him? I don't know what was in Captain Collins's mind at that time. I know that the aircraft should not have been in that position at that height. This we do know. The nature of the relationship between Air New Zealand and civil aviation intrigues Mann, and he feels compelled to raise his suspicions with the director of the division. 
Captain Kippenberger, has there been any measure of consultation between you and Air New Zealand about a combined approach to the Commission in the matter of evidence and probable cause? So far as I'm concerned, and as far as I know, no. It has not been suggested between the division and the company that the safe thing to do will be to put the whole blame on Captain Collins. No, it certainly has not. I'm just exploring the possibility as a matter of tactics that the airline and your division of the ministry may have thought it desirable to emphasize more than anything else that Paletera was the cause of the accident. But to your knowledge, it is not so. I can assure you, it is not so. Thank you, Captain Kibberberger. You may step down. Mann is later to conclude that civil aviation's approval of a flight path over Mount Erebus could not be justified under any circumstances. Silence. Stand up, please. He also concludes that civil aviation should not have agreed to the withdrawal of the requirement that all pilots to the Antarctic should have undertaken previous supervised flight to that region. The Erebus Commission Sir, has today heard a... Mr. Brown, cut. Richard? Sir, I've been going through the Chief Navigator's evidence. I think you'd better come yourself and hear what he has to say. Brian Hewitt, the Chief Navigator, is to become the first victim of the Erebus hearings. He will provide Marne with the most important clue as to what was in Captain Collins' mind as he approached the mountain. So until 1978, the route's down here, over Erebus, to the radio beacon, the NDB. In 1978, though, it's decided to computerize the flight plan. Mistake number one. Mr. Hewitt enters the coordinates for the ice runway here instead of the radio beacon. But that's not so bad because the difference is minor. The real mistake is that when he punches the coordinates into the computer, he hits the wrong key. 16648 became 16448. And that sent the route where? These mistakes lie in the computer for 14 months. 14 months? A couple of weeks before Collins takes off, the Captain Simpson flies down there. He seems to be the only pilot who plotted the actual destination waypoint. Two, 16448. It wasn't the position he had been expecting. What position was that? The Tacan. What? The radio beacon had been withdrawn by then. So the only ground navigational aid was here, the Tactical Air Navigation Aid. Or Tacan. And why would Simpson have been expecting that? It's customary to plan a flight track to the nearest ground navigational aid. When Simpson gets back to Auckland, he tells Ross Johnson that there's something wrong with the McMurdo destination waypoint and that it would be better positioned over here at the Tacan. Johnson tells Lawton of nav section. And Lawton, Lawton told me. When I checked the route, I had no idea that it was way over here. And I had no idea that I'd punched the four instead of the six. So that when I did the update, I thought I was just correcting my first mistake and shifting the track from here to here. 2.1 nautical miles. In fact, we're shifting it from here to here. 27 nautical miles. Mr. Hewitt, you say whilst typing information from the worksheet into the computer, you inadvertently typed the longitude at McMurdo as 164 degrees 48 east rather than 166 degrees 48 east. That is correct. We are told that in aviation navigation there is a principle of check, cross-check and recheck. On the process that you've described, what was your check as to the accuracy of the information you'd inserted? The visual check. What was your cross-check? I called the flight plan up and had a look at that. Your recheck? I did not do a recheck. Uh, Your Honor, could exhibit 47 NXG of Mr. Chippendale's report be shown to the witness? Now that map shows that the route goes to the west of Mount Erebus and not over the top, doesn't it? 
But this chart was produced for publicity purposes and not as an operational document. It, it's artist's license. Well, then I take it that you'd be surprised if that was given to the air crew in the course of their pre-flight briefing. I would be very surprised, sir. You say the publicity department prepared this? Yes. From what material? The information we gave them. Annex H. Do you know who prepared that map? Again, it's the publicity department. Prepared on the basis of information supplied by the navigation section? Yes, sir. This map also shows an incorrect track down McMurdo Sound? Yes, sir. And would you be surprised if that map was shown to flight crews as part of their pre-qualification briefing? Very surprised, sir. Because it is, of course, quite misleading as to the official track. Yes, sir. Annex I, the strip chart. The tracks there go to the west of Erebus, don't they? Yes, sir. And that is the military route down McMurdo Sound, is it not? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. No further questions. Of the maps and charts allegedly given to the crews at their briefings, only one shows the official track over Erebus. Mr. Davison. Annex J for Mr. Hewitt, please. And only one. This jet navigation chart was given by Air New Zealand to Ron Chippendale, the Chief Inspector of Air Accidents. It appears in his report as Annex J. You've told us this document was prepared prior to the first flights in 1977. Yes, sir. A copy was available in the briefing envelope that went on the first flight and was returned to the navigation section after each flight. I would like you to look at this document. Although Hewitt admits responsibility for the original mistake, neither he nor Air New Zealand Council is prepared for what follows. Now, it's not the same as Annex J, is it, Mr. Hewitt? I suggest to you that that line, that track on the new map between Cape Hallett and McMurdo Sound, indicates that somebody has drawn a track down McMurdo Sound to the position situated at 164 degrees, 48 minutes east. Would it surprise you to learn that this exhibit was attached to the briefing material, handed out to every pilot in connection with the 1978 flight? It would surprise me greatly. Well, let's recap. In September of 78, you make an error in selecting a position of 164 degrees 48 minutes. And then from the first briefing after that, an entirely different track and distance diagram with your mistaken coordinates on it appears and forms the basis of the pilot's briefing. Don't you think that's an unusual coincidence? It is. So the question arises, Mr. Ewart, as to whether the 164 degrees 48 minutes was a mistake in the first place. In other words, was it intended to have a flight track as shown on this exhibit? But in any event, taking a rather lesser view of the matter than Mr. Davidson's put into you, does this exhibit show near enough a track running down to the coordinates that you have told us are not correct? Those are the matters to be considered. You should have given us notice you were going to produce that document. So you did know about it? We were going to produce it ourselves. You didn't give us notice you were going to produce it? Lawton was going to produce it as part of his evidence. Why didn't they give that map to Chippendale then? Why did they only give Mannix J, showing the track of a Mount Erebus? And why did your executive mates tell Chippendale Annex J was used in the briefing when it wasn't, and not tell them about this map, which was used? We don't accept that. Mr. Hewitt, just looking now at the chain of circumstances which appear to have been the result of the navigation section's involvement in these flights, I suggest to you the first error was when you selected the wrong coordinates when you programmed the computers in September 1978. Do you agree that was an error or an omission? A minor inaccuracy. Secondly, you have told us you inadvertently pushed the wrong key 
Do you agree that was an error or omission? That was an error. Thirdly, when Mr. Brown was given the job of inserting the Fourthly, if it in fact be established that Mr. Lawton be the man who... If it be proved that Exhibit 1... Six failure by your section to pick up that the error in the McMurdo position... When you visually check what you put in, you omitted to pick up the difference between what was in front of you and what was on... Failure to insert the appropriate computer trigger. Captain Johnson was told by Captain Simpson that the difference between the... Failure of the pre-flight dispatch officer to advise Captain Collins... Then Captain Johnson's report to you of a 2.1 nautical mile change would be an error or omission? Yes. That is number 10. Can you think of any other errors or omissions we should add to the list before going any further? No, I can't. All these errors. And in a company, which in its navigation section tells us we are dealing with people who check and cross-check and recheck and never assume anything. It's a woeful story, isn't it? It is not a good story. I suggest to you, for people whose job it is to be precise, it is a woeful story. That is your opinion, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. You may step down. Gentlemen and ladies, although in the strictest sense of the word, this is not a courtroom, nevertheless, I would ask you to respect it as such. I think we can leave it there for today. Silence. Stand up, please. Query. Can the navigation section of an airline, which has won numerous international awards for safety and efficiency, possibly have made that many mistakes? Rhetorical, I think. Ah, but as if you do not have the doubtful privilege of hearing the evidence. Exhibit 164 is as far as it shows a track plotted down the sound to Hewitt's mistaken coordinates, a route which seems to be a natural extension of the safe military route. And in so far as it appeared in the pilot's briefing material at the same time as Hewitt's mistake suggests that the track down the sound was deliberate not a mistake. And if flight dispatch did not tell Collins of the change in the destination waypoint, where did Collins understand the plane's computerized flight track was taking him? What did the man see? What was he expecting to see? Yes. This is getting stupid. The company's making a public idiot of itself. Yeah, that's not our concern. We've still got to work for them. I suppose at the end of the day we shall hear another raft of quotes from Davison and Nicholson and McLaren. You opened your trap, Lloyd. I quote you too. Excuse me. Good morning. Ah, good morning. Peter Grundy, the flight operations manager, is Air New Zealand's first executive witness. And nothing but the truth. I do. Captain Grundy. Did you understand that the minimum altitude at which Air New Zealand aircraft were permitted to fly in the Antarctic was 6,000 feet? I did. Have you heard from Air New Zealand employees any suggestions that the aircraft may have been flying below 6,000 feet? I have not. I'd like you to look at this newspaper article. The 8 o'clock of Saturday, 22nd October 1977. It refers to a flight on a morning that week. Now, perhaps if I read this and you check that it's correct. Peter Muldrew is ecstatic and elated by the breathtaking panorama of the world's most alien territory. He points out landmarks he's come to know so well. Have you seen it? At the controls, Captain Hawkins brings the DC-10 down to 200 metres over Scott and McMurdo bases, well below the towering volcano Erebus belching smoke only 40 kilometres away. Did such a report come to your attention at any stage? It did not. If it had, would it have caused you concern? Yes, it would have, as it was a breach of the minimum altitude laid down. And nobody brought this article to your attention? They did not. It's the first time I've seen it. This is a trade magazine called Travelling Times, published in September 78. Yes. 
As we neared the Ross Ice Shelf, Captain Vetti began a gradual descent which would bring us to approximately 3,000 feet above the ice. Now that indicates, does it not, that the aircraft went below 6,000 feet? It does. Was that article ever drawn to your attention? This is the first time I've seen it. The Central Leader, published on the 28th of November 1978. I quote... We seem almost to hang over frozen land, and at 2,000 feet, we are low enough to see huts and vehicles clearly. Was that article ever drawn to your attention? It was not. The Western Leader, November 1978. Was that article ever drawn to your attention? It was not. Thank you, Captain Grundy. Mr. Davison. Kissing was on that flight. Who's Keesing? Doug Keesing. He was the Director of Flight Operations in 1978. Mr. Davison. Captain Grundy. As at the 7th of November, 1978, did Captain Keesing hold the position in Air New Zealand of Flight Operations Director? He did. And as such, he was the senior officer within the company having responsibility for flight operations. He was. Were you aware that Captain Keesing was on Captain McWilliams' flight, which descended to a level of 2,000 feet? I was aware quite some time afterwards that he was on that flight. When, exactly? I cannot recall exactly. If it were established that Captain Keesing well knew that the aircraft in which he had travelled had descended to a level of 2,000 feet, would you expect him, as Flight Operations Director, to have taken some steps to have ensured such descent did not recur on further flights, if, in fact, 6,000 feet was a minimum flight level. I would expect him to raise the matter, yes. To your knowledge, did he ever raise it with you? Not with me. With any other person? Not to my knowledge. Captain Grundy, do you know why it was that on the fatal flight, and not on other flights, that 6,000 feet was a minimum safe altitude. I do not, sir. <laughs> what about Grundy? See nothing, hear nothing on the low flight. Oh, I'd give him a five. Oh, six. It's worth at least that. Eight. A definite eight. Surely if Maury Davis knew what was going on down here, he'd put a stop to it. Somebody must be reporting to him. We should talk to him. Tell him what's really going on. Uh, let's see what briefing says. That's the guts of it. There was, to my recollection... No the question. first briefing officer to give evidence is Anthony Lawson. Captain Lawson, did you have knowledge of Antarctic flights descending below 6,000 feet before the accident occurred on the 28th of November, 1979? No, I do recall media comment prior to that period, yes. You do recall media comment prior to that period? Yes. Did you not think it a matter you should take up with the company, seeing you're involved with the qualifications of pilots on those routes? I believe at that time I had no responsibility in that direction. At the time, I was a line captain DC-10. So you didn't think it within your province to mention it to someone in authority in the company? I'd expect that ample evidence would have been available to those in such a position to take whatever action they desired. Particularly what are you referring to when you say there would be ample evidence to those in authority? I can recall a TV news item, and I believe that other means that came to my attention were some articles in the staff news. Lawson is the only Air New Zealand executive who admits any knowledge of the contents of the airline newsletter. But less than 24 hours later, after an overnight adjournment, he changes his mind. It says here, as the DC-10 cruised at 2,000 feet past Mount Erebus. That would convey to me that the aircraft passed over Mount Erebus at 2,000 feet. Mr. Lawson, are you now telling the Commission that the article simply talks about overflying Erebus at 2,000 feet? This article could certainly be read that way. What? I'm not asking you how it could be read, but how you read it at the time. I must have interpreted it that way, because I drew no undue concern for myself. Mr. Lawson. Take the single phrase, as the DC-10 cruised at 2,000 feet. What would that signify to your mind? I would have to read it in conjunction with the rest of the sentence, Your Honor. I'm asking you to read it not in conjunction. 
What would that single phrase signify to you? The aircraft had 2,000 feet clearance from whatever it was following, sir. Now, what about the phrase, past Mount Erebus? I would assume, from my viewpoint, Your Honor, it would have reference to a vertical separation. So, in your view, then, the phrase, as the DC-10 cruised at 2,000 feet past Mount Erebus, properly translated, means as the DC-10 cruised at 16,000 feet over Mount Erebus. I would have to assume that, sir. Now that you have refreshed well, your mind it. as to what happened yesterday, was it not your own view when you first read the airline newsletter that it referred to flights below 6,000 feet? As I think I tried to explain in my initial reading of this article, I... I conveyed the impression earlier that I did not consider it of great consequence at that time. The reason you gave yesterday for the lack of concern was that at that time you had no responsibility in that direction that you were a line captain DC-10. That's the reason you gave yesterday. Yes. Wasn't the short point that you realized there was low flying below 6,000 feet? But you were no longer concerned with briefing. You were just a line captain DC-10. And those in authority would have known full well what was going on. Isn't that what you told us? Yes, I would agree with that. Man is left wondering what might have led this intelligent witness to contradict and embarrass himself. As airline pilots association reps, naturally we're concerned that the pilots get a fair hearing. But we also feel a responsibility towards the company. Good, and it's good. Mm, thank you, Arthur. Mm. Well, we feel the company's getting increasingly isolated. Oh, we appreciate you coming to see us. You see, it's very difficult for someone in your position, with all due respect, to see the larger picture. It's the picture the public's getting that we're concerned about. <laughs> Don't you worry about our public image. We employ specialists to take care of that. Have any of them been down to the hearings lately? Because the company line is being met with open disbelief. Now, just tie ho there a minute, Arthur. As I understand it, you guys have pulled a couple of red herrings across the judge's eyes. Well, it's early days and he's no fool. There's a larger game being played out here with larger stakes than you people seem to realise. Now, if you guys would just settle down... Look, we just came in here to tell you... I asked you to talk with us from the very beginning and you refused. Isn't that right, Dave? Dead right. We're a company which puts enormous emphasis on pride and loyalty. You should know that. We want to get to the bottom of this thing too. But I am telling you that there are factors in this thing that you as pilots know nothing about. Mrs. Mann? Oh, hello, Mrs. Adams. How are you? I've been at the hearings. Every day I haven't missed a session. Oh, and, uh, are you finding them interesting? It's terribly frustrating. I, I feel like standing up and shouting what you take us for, fools. I mean, all those people dead. Well, what did you make of that? Who was he talking about, these larger forces? I know. Thought he might have meant the insurers. I got a strong feeling it was the government. Mother. Now, you remember Mrs. Adamson? I see her every day at the hearings. Yes, well, she's taken an interest. Not much else to keep her occupied. That's nice. She is not a woman given to emotional outbursts. She has certainly conducted herself with the utmost decorum. Oh, Peter, it's like getting blood out of a stone. She says they're telling you lies. <laughs> That's possible. Yes, but the inference is that you're being taken in by them. It's the old story, Margarita. What seems to be a lie one day may very well turn out to be the truth the next. One is obliged to listen to all the evidence. 
You know, that's what I told Mrs. Adamson. Good. Good. The second briefing officer to give evidence is Captain John Wilson. On the 9th of November, 19 days before takeoff, he briefed Collins and his crew on the flight south. At the very end of his evidence, after seeming to confirm the Air New Zealand position that aircraft were not to descend below 6,000 feet, Wilson makes a startling admission. However, in 1978, I had become aware by overhearing comments that certain flights had gone below 6,000 feet. Up until March the 14th, 1979, I was located in the 17th floor of the Air New Zealand house within the Flight Operations Division. And it was in Air New Zealand House that I overheard these comments. These reports did not give me concern, as it was my belief that air traffic control at McMurdo retained the ability to give consent to descend lower than 6,000 feet. I remember remarking in passing at some of my Antarctic briefings that I was aware that certain flights had been below 6,000 feet. When I made this comment to Cruz, it was not with any tone of criticism, but for the reason I have just given, mainly that I assumed that it had been done with the prior authority of the air traffic control at McMurdo. This statement from the briefing supervisor seems to strike at the foundations of Air New Zealand's position on low flying. Did you tell Mr. Chippendale that you had discussed with other crews descent below 6,000 feet and not criticize such action? No, I did not. Did you tell Mr. Chippendale that it was your understanding that the air crew on Antarctic flights could negotiate descents below 6,000 feet with the local air traffic control? I don't believe I did. Then why did you not tell Mr. Chippendale what you've just told this commission? I don't follow what your line of question is there. I can't relate your question to what Mr. Chippendale had asked me. The issue of flight below 6,000 feet was an important issue during the course of the accident investigation and the course of this inquiry. Well, coming below 6,000 feet in my experience as a practicing pilot is no hazard in visual conditions. But you didn't tell Mr. Chippendale that you had mentioned this to other crews when briefing them? No. Did it seem to be quite common knowledge that flights were descending below 6,000 feet? I don't know if you would have said it was common knowledge. I had heard. And on more than one occasion? Yes. Was it your impression that aircraft were permitted to descend below 16,000 feet in any area outside that safety sector? I'd interpreted that sector as being for a general instrument letdown and that in strictly visual conditions, and providing the captain had received permission from McMurdo ATC, he could have descended outside that sector. Now, did you state that to the pilots at the Collins briefing? No, there was no discussion on that. At the Collins briefing, were the crews shown any chart on which the actual track over Mount Erebus was drawn? No. Did you indicate by pencil or otherwise the actual track? I did. And you made it specifically clear that the track took the aircraft in the vicinity of the summit of Mount Erebus? I did. Captain Wilson, were you aware at the time of the briefing that pilots were not obliged to follow that track over Mount Erebus? Yes. But if you knew that, why did you tell them they would be flying over Mount Erebus? <clears throat> I was following the prepared script where it says so. I suggest to you, Captain Wilson, that in the written briefing material, that is the prepared script you say you were following, there is in fact not a single written word to indicate the flight will be taking you over Mount Erebus. But that was made clear in my remarks. Just answer yes or no. There is no specific written word. There were in fact two crews of the briefing you conducted, weren't there, Captain Wilson? Yes. Collins and his crew are dead. But of those still living, we have Captain Gabriel, First Officer Irvine, and their commander, Captain Simpson. And I think you will recognize them there at the back of the room. Do you see them? Yes, I see them. <coughs> and so, apart from yourself, the other three living persons who are in a position to assist the Commission as to what was discussed verbally at your briefing are Messrs. Gabriel, Simpson, and Irvine. Is that correct? Yes. 
Is it fair to say, Captain, that you are simply not equipped to brief crews for a low-level scenic flight without having been there before? That would be correct. You have told Council that you made earlier requests to go down to the Antarctic. Did you emphasize the point that we've just discussed, that you could hardly brief people on a scenic flight at low level when you hadn't been there yourself? It would be a little like the blind leading the blind, would it not? Yes. Would you answer any questions put to you by His Honor? Thank you, Captain Wilson. You may step down. Wilson's evidence is greatly at variance with the Air New Zealand executive evidence already given. And Wilson becomes, after Hewitt, the second major casualty of the hearings. Captain Wilson, the briefing officer, said he himself had no experience of flying down there despite having asked several times to be rostered on an Antarctic flight. Captain Wilson's evidence seems at variance with a statement made by Air New Zealand's chief executive, Maury Davis, on the 24th of June, in which he said that Air New Zealand ensured that briefing officers flew over each of the company's routes regularly. And at Captain Ross Johnson conducted the simulator briefings for Collins and Simpson's crew. Johnson is adamant about the minimum altitudes. But when referring to the flight in 1977, which he himself commanded, he makes an extraordinary admission. Whilst orbiting McMurdo Base, I requested clearance from air traffic control to descend. This was approved, and I descended to 3,000 feet. Were you aware in descending to 3,000 feet that you were disobeying a restriction imposed by your employer? Yes, I was. Is it common for Air New Zealand pilots to disobey restrictions imposed by the company? I would not believe so, but... Had you done it before? No, I had not. Not knowingly. Well, you, when you were giving briefings, would have expected other pilots to obey your restrictions? Yes, I would. Why then on this occasion did you disobey a restriction? That is something of which I'm certainly not proud. I don't believe in the context it took place it was unsafe. Of course, that doesn't condone it. Did you, after your flight, tell any of your fellow pilots that you'd gone below the minimum restricted altitude? No, I don't believe I did. I saw a journalist holding up a number, written on a piece of paper. Eight, I believe. But either of you know what that signifies? I can't say I saw it. Gary, I think they're just sort of um, running their own truth is stranger than fiction competition, sir. It had been made very clear at the briefing. Johnson also reveals that although he understood the route to be over Erebus and briefed the crews accordingly, he himself had nevertheless flown down McMurdo Sound on his approach. On your flight south, you departed from the planned track and proceeded to McMurdo down McMurdo Sound. Yes, that is correct. And you felt free to do that as long as you had air traffic control authority? Yes, I did feel free to do that. And I'm sure it was well within the intent of the operation. Hmm. With regard to the slides that were being shown at the audio-visual briefing you gave Collins, was it not important that those slides depicted the track that you intended the aircraft to follow? Yes, it was. And we now know that certain slides depicted a different track, don't we? Yes, we do. If Captain Simpson, Gabriel and First Officer Irvine all considered that the route was down McMurdo Sound, if there was a misunderstanding as to whether civil aviation's approval had been given for descent in the McMurdo area, if the route had not been defined on any topographical map, if the briefing officer, Captain Wilson, thought that there could be a descent below 6,000 feet, and if there was not a proper understanding of whiteout, would you agree that not only the briefing of Captain Collins, but the briefings for Antarctic flights in general were inadequate? I would have to have a measure of agreement with you. The navigation section was involved. The briefing section was involved. The simulator was involved. 
and head office was involved in arrangements with civil aviation. Whose responsibility was it to coordinate all those people involved in this area? My responsibility. What now? The $64,000 question. We asked Johnson what Simpson said to him about the McMurdo destination coordinates. Simpson says he mentioned to Johnson a 27-mile cross-track difference. If he did, if he actually mentioned the number of miles, then there's no excuse for Hewitt and Johnson treating the correction as 2.1 miles. And no excuse for Hewitt not notifying flight dispatch, and no excuse for flight dispatch not telling your husband that his approach to McMurdo was taking him not over flat sea ice, but straight at a 13,000-foot volcano. That telephone conversation with Captain Simpson took place after Simpson's flight, did it not? I'll take that as being correct. Captain Simpson will say he did not mention the actual coordinates to you. Do you recall him mentioning a cross-track error? Not in specific miles or magnitude. Do you not recall him telling you he'd been surprised at seeing approximately 27-mile cross-track difference when he was overhead the TACAN navigation aid? No, I do not. Do I gather you made a record of what was said? I noted it down, I believe. Uh, do you have that? No. I don't believe I do. It was noted on a pad and I believe I then processed the three points. Oh, thank God it's Friday. Not over yet. Get our New Zealand Council in here. David. Yes. The uh, commissioner would like to see you in his chambers. Oh, no. David, it is axiomatic that no final conclusions on matters of credibility can ever be reached until all the evidence is heard. Yes, sir. However, I am bound to say that I have grave doubts about the navigation and briefing evidence. As far as the navigation evidence goes, for all I know, there may be a document produced which completely confirms that very involved series of errors. We shall wait and see. But as for the briefing evidence... Your Honour. The analysis of the flight recorder, I think you will agree, proves that Collins assiduously held that aircraft on its computerised flight track after each descending orbit. And if that is the case? If that is the case, David, then how can it still be said by your briefing officers that Collins and Cassins really believe that computerized flight track led them towards Erebus? Are your briefing officers saying that Collins deliberately flew that aircraft at 1,500 feet straight into a mountain right in front of them? I am disturbed by the air of profound disbelief which seems to pervade these hearings. This is not a criminal trial. It is a public inquiry which is charged with finding the cause of a disaster in which 257 people lost their lives. Its raison d'etre is surely to prevent any reoccurrence of such a tragedy. And that is all. Finally, therefore, it is our firm conclusion that because of this sudden tilt in the Earth's surface, at the precise time of Flight 901's approach, Mount Erebus rose into the air and collided with the DC-10. We trust that you will give our conclusions due weight in your deliberations. Yours sincerely, the Flat Earth Society. We must reply, thanking the Society for its contribution to what is for all of us an extremely complex question. It is September 1980. Scott. The Erebus Commission enters its third month. The dynamics of the hearings are about to change. 
It's the Pilots Association's turn to call its witnesses to give evidence. And the line pilots must prove under oath the allegations Council have been putting to Air New Zealand witnesses. Morning, Liz. I'm just trying to warn you. Till now, Air New Zealand's been putting them up and we've been shooting them down on the basis of what the pilots would say. But they've got jobs and families. Captain Leslie Simpson and his crew attended the same briefing as Collins. The briefing officer, Captain Wilson, referred to many matters in the course of his briefing that I do not recall. Captain Wilson said he mentioned to us that the track would come from Cape Hallett over Erebus to McMurdo. I have absolutely no recollection of him saying this. My understanding was that the track proceeded to a position in McMurdo Sound. Simpson goes on to detail his phone call to Ross Johnson which set off a chain reaction in Air New Zealand's flight operations, leading to a change in the McMurdo destination waypoint. The contents of that phone call are hotly disputed. I did not report this matter to Captain Johnson as an error in position, as I had no reason to believe the 16448 position at the bottom of McMurdo Sound was other than the logical point to terminate the flight plan track. Captain Johnson is not correct when he states that I rang him and told him that the McMurdo position was in error and should be 166 degrees 58 minutes. Uh, Captain Johnson's recollection is also incorrect on the matter of my mentioning the cross-track distance. I certainly did mention to him that the cross-track distance to the nearest ground navigational aid was approximately 27 miles to ensure that subsequent crews were not unnecessarily surprised at the distance. Thank you, Captain Simpson. Would you answer any questions? Captain Simpson, my instructions enable me to say to you that so far as my client company is concerned, your integrity and veracity are beyond any question. For your part, do you accept a similar position so far as Captains Ross Johnson and John Wilson are concerned? Yes. Does it matter what he thinks? It's what I think. You would accept, no doubt, that there are areas where your recollection diverges from that of Captains Johnson and Wilson. Yes. Would you also accept that they and you could be at fault in certain areas of personal recollection? I make no claim to having an impeccable memory. I heard and saw the briefing once. But Captain Wilson's evidence in general I have no great conflict with. It's just the extreme fine detail that he appears to have included for the commission that I don't recall. In Captain Johnson's case, however, the description I heard in this court was so different to my recollection of that briefing that I wondered if, in fact, I'd attended the same briefing. Captains Johnson and Wilson would almost inevitably have had some regard to the notes from which they used to work. Yes, I would expect so. Whereas what you carried away was a, a general impression. Yes. But I was asked to recall my flight and the briefings at an interview with Mr. Chippendale and Captain Gemmell only one month after I made the flight. As well as giving Captain Eden a copy of that interview, I kept one for my own record, so I do have that available for reference. This interview, one month after your flight, you say, included as a member of the group Mr. Gemmell? Yes, sir. Am I to take it then that your explanation as to how you came to report the coordinates position was given at that meeting? Yes, that's correct. Therefore, the airline has known from mid-December of last year, about 15 days after the disaster, your exact position on that matter. Yes, sir. As a puzzle for you, Gatter, that Air New Zealand have known the nature of Simpson's evidence for so long, yet have maintained implacably their position that the official route was always over Erebus and that the minimum prescribed altitude was 6,000 feet. The tickets, Your Honour. Uh, Washington, Florida, then London. Thank you. Let Mr. Baraguanath know. Perhaps Simpson's understanding of the briefing was just peculiar to him. And I have absolutely no recollection of Captain Wilson advising us at any stage that our flight track would overfly Mount Erebus. As regards the 6,000 feet height, 
and I considered this to be for the purpose of a cloud break procedure, and that further descent in VMC, visual meteorological conditions, was at the captain's discretion, subject to approval from the local McMurdo air traffic controller. Simpson and Gabriel's understanding of their briefing is not unique. A succession of line pilots take the stand. They had been briefed for Antarctic flights at different times over a period of two years before the crash. I do not recall Captain Wilson making any clear statement to the effect that we would overfly Mount Erebus. And subject to clearance by the local air traffic controller, I considered I was at liberty to descend further so long as VMC conditions could be maintained. I took from our briefing that the flight track passed to the west of Mount Erebus and that our approach to the McMurdo area was via the McMurdo Sound. I did not understand from the briefing that we were restricted from descending below 6,000 feet. But an executive pilot, Captain Maynard Hawkins, flight manager training, testifies to a different understanding of his briefing. I have a clear recollection that we did not descend below 6,000 feet, which in my mind was clearly the company's minimum permissible altitude. I'm aware that a newspaper article has been produced at this commission, which states that my flight descended to approximately 700 feet above the ice shelf. This is definitely not correct. Are you saying that such a statement was factually incorrect because the aircraft was never anything like that low? The statement is totally incorrect. We have received information from a passenger on your flight and he understood that the aircraft descended to approximately 1,000 feet. Was that information also quite incorrect? That would be totally incorrect. Mr. McAllister. Captain Vetti attended the same briefing as you attended. Correct. And Captain Vetti is a flight instructor, DC-10s. Correct. And are you aware that Captain Vetti descended to 1,500 feet whilst over McMurdo? Yes, I am now aware of that fact. So we're left with two alternatives. Either Captain Vetti interpreted the briefing instructions differently from you, or he deliberately disobeyed those instructions. Uh, are you suggesting that Captain Vetti deliberately disobeyed them? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. In fact, many senior captains in Air New Zealand have interpreted the instructions differently from you, haven't they? Yes, it would appear so. I put it to you that if instructions are ambiguous, then they are deficient, aren't they? In hindsight, yes. Silence. Stand up, please. The pilots know damn well that Collins should have checked the coordinates when he entered them in the plane's computer. He should have plotted them on a topographical map before he got to the Antarctic. He shouldn't have descended below 16,000 feet until he'd got an independent fix. And if they were expecting the track to take them down the sound, they should have noticed that Beaufort Island was on their right instead of on their left. Please, Ian, it's late. The point is, they're walking all over us. If Collins didn't know where he was, why didn't he know where he was? The coordinates. The coordinates. I'm sick to death of hearing about them. Coordinates. He should have plotted them. He's the pilot in command. He's got to know where he is! So one important question. Air New Zealand changes tack and makes 12 separate allegations of pilot error. Their common element is the proposition that Colin should not have been misled by the mistaken coordinates. If he did not know where he was, that was his fault, not the company's. I readily agree that had the extent of the change to the McMurdo coordinates been known within the company, prior to the accident, then the changes should have been reported to Captain Collins prior to takeoff. However, I don't believe that the failure to do so justifies Collins's omission to check that the coordinates he received at the briefing were the same as those contained in the actual flight plan of the day. But Gemmell's view is strongly opposed by the line pilots. Now, did you receive another flight plan on the day of your flight? Yes, I did. Did you have any reason to believe that it would be in any way different from the flight plan that was handed to you at the briefing? No, I did not. You felt entitled to rely on the information given at the briefing as being the same as on the day of your flight? Yes, I did. 
At all previous briefings I've been to, there has usually been a copy of the relevant flight plan. And when I subsequently come to fly the particular route, the flight plan has always been identical to that given at the briefing. If any coordinates have been changed between the time you received the flight plan at the briefing and the day of your flight, would you expect that information to be passed on to you? Yes, I would. Thank you very much. You told us you plotted the McMurdo coordinates during your flight. Yes. If you had plotted the McMurdo waypoint prior to your flight, from information given at the briefing, do you think you would have done it again during your flight? No. I don't think I would have. The requirement remains for the pilot to identify his position independently of the onboard AINS navigation equipment. And in the absence of ground-based radio or radar information, that can only be done by positively identifying geographical features visually before descending from minimum safe altitude. It's possible to see how a situation could have developed to the point where the crew eventually ran out of options in what perhaps may best be described as a conspiracy of circumstances extending back much earlier than the last 30 minutes of the CVR tape. That such a series of events and coincidences should have developed to the point which the evidence before this commission has revealed almost defies belief. And yet they happened. To try and identify the part which any one action or decision played in causing or contributing to the accident is most difficult under such circumstances. However, the pilot in command is the person ultimately responsible for the safety of his aircraft and passengers. The man on the spot, whose decisions and actions decide the fate of all those on board. The Airline Pilots Association witnesses say, and I think correctly, that Collins would have been entitled to rely on the information given him at his briefing and could have expected to have been notified of any change to the flight plan. But the question still arises as to whether Collins did in fact rely on that flight plan given him at the briefing. Did he plot the false route from that flight plan onto a map or chart? And if so, when did he do that? You'll be asked to swear on the Bible, to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Don't be frightened. Stand up straight and, and look only at the person who is asking the question. question. And say only what you remember. Yes. No more, no less. That's what your father would have wanted. It's all right, Mum. Don't worry. One of the final clues in Mann's quest as to what was in Colin's mind as he approached Erebus lay with the pilot's widow and his daughters. What will they ask me? They'll concentrate on Jim's plotting of the route. They'll try to undermine your credibility, Maria. I can't protect you from that. What about the girls? I'm hoping Mom won't make them take the stand. Now, Elizabeth, in your affidavit, you say that your father was working on the kitchen table with maps the night before the flight. And you came in and looked over his shoulder. Do you recall anything about the maps he was working on? He had the New Zealand atlas that Nana and Granddad gave him open on the table. And he had another bigger map. A bigger map. When Dad opened it to show me where he was going, it was too big for the kitchen table, so we spread it out on the floor. And what do you remember about it? The sea was a green colour, and there were purple colours for the land. Anything else? The first thing that caught my eye was the Ross Sea shelf. Yeah, show me. I asked Dad if that was where they were going to land. He said although the shelf was solid ice, that they wouldn't be landing. 
I remember he ran his finger down the raggedy edge of the Ross Sea and said, we keep fairly close to this bumpy lot. Richard, I've got to return to chambers. Keep Mrs. Collins on the stand until I get back. Ask her to recite Bar Bar Black Sheep if you have to, but keep her there. Morning, Lloyd. He had a ruler or some measuring equipment and was working on a large chart of the Antarctic Ross Sea region. He indicated the path of the aircraft down the coast of Victoria Land to McMurdo Sound. I remember he mentioned flying over the Dry Valley area and he indicated the aircraft would fly back from McMurdo Sound up the same coastline on its return flight. Do not recall him making any mention of Mount Erebus. M my father was working. You've done very well, Catherine. Thank you both for coming in, helping us, Gary. That affidavits will be sufficient, David. They won't have to be called. My husband would have spent between one and a half and two hours working on these maps and materials at the dining room table. It was a reasonably frequent practice of his, spend time in preparation of his flights, going over briefing materials, etc., particularly in respect of a new route that he hadn't flown before or a route that he hadn't recently flown. He came back through from the girls' room about 9.30, quarter to 10, after tucking in Elizabeth and Catherine. I was looking at some publicity brochures as he packed up his maps and instruments. And at one stage, he came up behind me and looked over my shoulder. He was excited at the prospect of going down there. And he said something like, awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Expecting me to agree. I can remember just shivering and saying, I can't get enthusiastic over a hunk of ice and snow. I really can't. Would you be good enough to answer any questions put to you by counsel? Mr. McLaren? Nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Nicholson. I have no questions. Mr. McGrain. <clears throat> no questions, Your Honor. You may step down, Mrs. Collins. Mann is now convinced that Collins relied on the false information given him at the briefing and plotted a flight track which he knew would take his DC-10 down McMurdo Sound over the flat sea ice well clear of Erebus. do you think? Hmm? Peter, you have got to check in at some ungodly hour tomorrow morning. I am trying to get your suitcase packed. Sorry. What is the matter? I woke to find myself in a dark wood where the right road was wholly lost and gone. Ah me, how hard to speak of it. <laughs> 
Oh dear, has it come to that? The commission adjourns while Mann and assisting counsel David Baraguanath follow a trail which will provide a succession of hammer blows to Chippendale's report. In Washington, D.C., they visit the National Transportation Safety Board's audio laboratory. Colonel Paul Turner had assisted with the original transcription of the cockpit voice recorder. The team of New Zealanders he assisted had been chosen for its knowledge of the crew's voices and its familiarity with DC-10 flight procedure. Through here, gentlemen. The Chippendale rejected parts of that transcription and took the CVR tape to England, where he carried out his own transcription at the Farnborough Laboratories. So, did Mr. Chippendale know the voices of the crew? No, Colonel. Well, was anyone there with him in England who did know the voices? Apparently not. One of the changes made by Chippendale particularly interests me because of the strenuous objections made to it by the Airline Pilots Association. It's thick here, eh, hey Bird? That was seized upon by the media, understandably, as indicating that the aircraft was flying in cloud. And that would put your pilot at fault? Precisely. Is that it? Again, please. So, bit thick here, eh, Bert, becomes what? Well, I personally would transcribe that as, this is Kate Bird. Was anyone on the flight deck known as Bert? No. There's something else that puzzles me. We played the whole tape through several times. Chippendale's report from memory said that the two engineers on the flight deck had voiced frequent queries and had expressed their mounting alarm. That received enormous publicity. Where is all that? I think you have to realize, gentlemen, that Mr. Chippendale seems to have made the Farnborough transcriptions with a theory already in mind. Now, that can leave you hearing what you expect to hear. The following day, Mann and Baraguana fly to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, for an appointment at the Bendix Corporation, the manufacturers of the DC-10's weather radar. Chippendale had concluded that this equipment would have depicted the mountainous terrain ahead. The crew's failure to monitor the radar and see Erebus had made headlines when his report was released. When an aircraft enters cloud, it almost always suffers from turbulence. Okay, our radar is designed to pick up the presence of cloud ahead at long range. The radio impulses are transmitted from the aircraft and they pick up the moisture in the cloud. There's no moisture, there's no return on the screen. What is the moisture content in the ice in Antarctica? It's almost devoid of moisture. It's considered to be drier than the Sahara Desert. The ice surface of the Ross Sea is totally dry, as is the thick coating of ice on Mount Erebus. Simple. No return. That's if the radar was set in the weather mode. And if it was set in the other mode, the mapping mode? You would get some sort of blurred return from the ice. So they would have seen the mountain, albeit in blurred form? No. They'd be getting the same return off the mountain ice as they were getting off the sea ice. Surely there must be a difference between the return of flat sea ice and the return of the ice on the slopes of Erebus. Not necessarily. The mountain itself would give off what we call shadow effect, behind the blurred ice return. But it would be distorted and unclear. You would have to know precisely what you were looking for. You'd have to know the mountain was there. If, hypothetically, the pilot thought he was flying over the flat sea ice of McMurdo Sound, 
Would the return have tended to confirm that? If that's where he believed he was, yes. The assertion by the chief inspector that the DC-10's radar would have depicted the mountain had featured prominently in the New Zealand and international press. The immediate reaction of the public had been that the aircraft crew had failed to look at the radar screen when flying in impaired visibility and had failed to see the clear and unmistakable outline of the mountain right in front of them. For Mark, that has now been proved a fallacy. Under his terms of reference, Mann is also required to consider whether there have been any act or omission by McMurdo Air Traffic Control which contributed to the disaster. There had been evidence which suggested the DC-10 might well have appeared on US Navy radar at McMurdo, but the Chief Air Traffic Controller on the day of the disaster disagrees. I believe the DC-10 was not identified on our radar screen, sir. Can we take this in steps, Warrant Officer? The flight recorder confirms that the aircraft's transponder was activated at this point, G. Would the radar operator not have been able to say at that point that the aircraft was just to the geographical northeast of Mount Bird and warn the pilot? If he saw the blip on the radar screen. But he did not, sir. Mann asks to speak to the radar operator and the VHF radio operator. But Lieutenant Commander Fessler, the U.S. Navy attorney, springs a surprise. I understood they were available. They are not. May I ask why? My orders are simply that they are not available for questioning here at this time. And might I question them elsewhere at another time? I'm afraid not. May I speak with your superior? It is my decision. They do be able to give me an answer to my earlier query as to the reason for that unavailability. I am sorry, sir. Very well, Lieutenant Commander. I have another request. I wish to visit the McMurdo installation. In the Antarctic? We're still there, I take it. Yes, uh, you may go there. Thank you. But only if you give me your unconditional guarantee that you will question no one down there, and I mean no one. If you want to ask questions, I have got to accompany you. I'm given to understand that there's a Navy attorney down there all the time. Surely there's no need. Those are the conditions, sir. Well, this was clearly your decision, Lieutenant Commander. Good day. Sir, I need your guarantee. I shall let you know. All in good time. While the U.S. Navy seems intent to balk Mann, Lloyds of London, who act for Air New Zealand's insurance syndicate, seem just as anxious to talk. Mann is asked to meet Peter Martin, Lloyd's solicitor. I thought since you were both in London, it was an ideal opportunity for a chat. A chance for an informal discussion on how things are going down there. Thank you. Off the record, of course. I'm afraid that isn't possible, Mr. Martin. Any discussion involving the inquiry can't be off the record. As Royal Commissioner, His Honor is obliged under his warrant. Very well. Very well. As you are aware, gentlemen, I receive daily transcripts of evidence from New Zealand. These, as I'm sure you're also aware, have been very carefully studied, not just by me. It's fair to say that both I and my clients, that is the insurance syndicate, are becoming somewhat perturbed at the nature of evidence being produced by New Zealand. Mr. Martin, I can tell you what I told Air New Zealand Council, that I do have severe reservations about the credibility of Air New Zealand's altitude and navigational evidence, but that I have as yet reached no conclusions. Yes, yes. Nevertheless, it is likely that you will be compelled to make adverse findings against Air New Zealand as to the credibility of their evidence. Look, I want to make it quite clear that Lloyds has played no part in concocting these false explanations. 
For Marne, the jigsaw puzzle is almost complete. On the first anniversary of the disaster, he flies south to the Antarctic. It matters little that Lieutenant Commander Fessler has ensured a hostile reception by the US Navy at McMurdo Base, because Marne experiences for himself the whiteout phenomenon and the last piece of the puzzle falls into place. Man will fly home with a graphic picture of the moods of nature dominating the last place on Earth. After four months of hearings and over 50 witnesses, a film recovered from a passenger's camera at the crash site to screen for the commission. It is a potent reminder of why they're all there. What angle is he taking on this, Lloyd? Difficult to say precisely, Des. Difficult to know what Marne's line of thinking is. Baragona's questions seem to be consistently pointing towards some sort of general... <clears throat> administrational malaise. What? David? There has been the odd difficulty, much of it, of course, caused by the Pilots Association keeping evidence like Exhibit 164 up its sleeve. The bums! I mean, what the devil are they trying to do to us? Mr. Davis, the atmosphere in that room between Air New Zealand and the pilots has not been a pretty thing to behold. It's verged on open hostility. Yes, but why? There seems to be a, a feeling amongst them that Air New Zealand wants a finding of pilot error. Rubbish. We have avoided speculation at all times. We've always wanted an open inquiry. Quiet, Murray. Mr. Davis, you're shortly going to have to give evidence yourself. Yes? And there may be areas which will cause you some difficulty. We should prepare carefully. I don't want to look at Turkey up there. When you made the decision to shred the documents, was that of your own initiative or on instructions? Mr. Watson, the chairman of our committee, and I together made the decision that surplus documents would be destroyed. I took the decision to have them shredded. Was that matter discussed with Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis was in the office on one occasion when we were discussing the disposal of documents. No further questions, Your Honour. Thank you, Mr. Oldfield. You may step down. I call Morris and Ritchie Davis. As Mann watches the chief executive come forward and take the stand, he is reflecting on all that he's seen and heard about the man. In particular, his loyalty and tenacity in defense of his company. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. During my 35 years with the airline, I have seen it develop from somewhat humble beginnings down at Mechanics Bay, operating flying boats across the Tasman, progressively re-equipping through to our present DC-10s. Despite the problems which arose in operating aircraft during those early pioneering years... Mann realizes he's listening to the story of an archetypal self-made man and he begins to understand Davis's close identification with the company and why Davis has risen to any attack on Air New Zealand as if it were an attack on his own flesh and blood. The company's policy was and is to place before the Commission all material relevant to its terms of reference irrespective of whether such evidence was favorable to the airline or not. Instructions were given to counsel accordingly. My attitude from the very outset was that all facts must be ascertained and revealed. 
Do you recall being aware from any source that some copies of documents were being put through the shredder at head office? We insisted at the uh, <clears throat> outset of the in-house investigation that all relevant documents should be placed in a specific file and that uh, any extraneous matter, like duplicates, should in fact be put aside. Uh, but no document in itself was destroyed. I don't think you've told us why you thought it was necessary to issue order for destruction in the first place. The security circumstances of the company affairs, not only in Air New Zealand, but generally throughout the country at this time, is that people seek to make a name for themselves by passing the relevant documents and sometimes immaterial, uh, uh, but also provocative documents to the media. Having experienced this, I recognise that it could in fact be distressing to all concerned. Matters taken out of context. Considerations given that were erroneous. I required one single file, unadulterated and authenticated. The fact that there had been an error of two degrees in the coordinates was never a matter publicly acknowledged by the company. You're referring to a public statement? Yes. I'm the prime individual involved in making the statements. I confine my remarks to the facts when questioned whether there was a fault in the computer or in the accident flight. My reply was that there was not. Was it ever publicly acknowledged that there had been a change of two degrees made before the night of the flight? Not by me. Was it ever made by any other person in the company, to your knowledge? As far as I'm aware, no. I can't account for some people in the organisation who may have sought some allegiance with the press by passing out information that's confidential. Was the decision not to disclose the two-degree change in coordinates a deliberate decision made by you as chief executive? It was my decision to confine my remarks about the coordinates to the information contained within the navigational equipment of the accident flight. And you feel that you made a fair disclosure to the public, given the questions asked of you? Yes. I should explain that at the time the information came to me that there had been a previous error that had been added to the computer. I mean, taken out of context, it could assume an importance that otherwise was not due to it. Now, whether that is as valid now as it was then is open to conjecture. Did you not consider it more prudent to take the initiative and disclose the matter in its correct context? I didn't feel the need to explain myself to the press, no. We're talking about the public, not the press. The media whereby the public are kept informed. I didn't see under the circumstances at the time that I was under any significant obligation to make disclosures to the press or to the public via the press. Mr. McElhenney, Exhibit 84, Your Honour. An article by Mr. John Brizendine in the Travelling Times. Mr. Brizendine's flight to the Antarctic was personally arranged by you, was it not? It was. And did he not send you a personal note at the conclusion of the flight? He did. And did he enclose with it a copy of the article he proposed to have published? Yes. And did you reply to him and thank him? I noted that I'd received his letter, yes. Did you reply to him and thank him? I can't recall the contents of the letter in exact terms, no. But let me get this straight. You did drop him a note saying you had received his letter. I usually do. I just don't recall whether on this occasion I did in fact write formally to him or not. I'm afraid I can't answer that. Would you have written and thanked him without reading the proposed article? Oh, indeed. And are you sure you didn't read it at all? I'm as certain as I can be. He was the chairman of McDonnell Douglas, was he not? President. But even in his case, you did not read his memo before replying. Mr. Brizendine is an old friend of mine. We have talked together, formally and informally, over the years, and write letters from time to time. The fact is, I would not normally spend the time to read an article about a flight in which he had already formally thanked me personally. 
having personally arranged for Mr. Brizendine to take that flight and go on to that trouble, weren't you concerned to see that the company got some favorable publicity? I didn't invite him for that purpose. Therefore, I would be totally unconcerned whether we got good publicity or not. Ah, Gary. Ask the um, Department of Justice to put an inquiry agent onto the Brizendine issue of the Travelling Times. I want to know what its distribution was and whether Air New Zealand had a hand in it. For one reason or another, the minimum altitudes were not adhered to, and this state of affairs persisted over many months. It seems to have been common knowledge, so far as the company's internal newspaper is concerned, and the Travelling Times document, together with Air New Zealand personnel who flew on the aircraft, including your own deputy. From where you stand at the top of the executive, is it not a matter of some concern that this state of affairs could have continued, and for so long? Very much so. Have you reflected on any basic problems in the company that have contributed to this? I am convinced, after many discussions and many considerations, that the pilot morale, while everything has its ups and downs, is at a very excellent level. In my opinion, no other reason existed, or does exist at the present time. I don't want to be misunderstood. I wasn't thinking of morale, but rather basic lack of communication. Obviously, very senior people in the company knew what the aircraft were doing. It was common knowledge amongst those who chose to read the literature. And yet, the executive pilot seemed not to have been told, or if they were told, did not do anything about it. I wish I could answer you in more precise fashion. I do not believe there exists at this time an organization so dedicated to communications uh, within staff levels as does Air New Zealand. The question of the dissemination of this particular information about low flying remains a mystery to me. It is the broad effect of your evidence, then, that you are content with the company organizational arrangements as they stand. I am of the opinion the organization situation in the company, in the operational department that existed at the time of the Antarctic flights was, if operated reasonably, capable of sustained proper communication in the matters I think you're referring to. Thank you, Mr. Davis. No further questions. Did you answer any questions put to you by His Honor? Mr. Davis, were you made aware of the arrangements to distribute throughout New Zealand a copy of Mr. Brizendine's article contained in the Travelling Times? No. Evidently, there were a million copies printed. And they all referred, of course, to the scenic flight at 3,000 feet. This occurred in 1978. Yes. Would that have been done by the commercial division? As I understand it, the publication you refer to is produced by a subsidiary of Air New Zealand called ANZAC. And they have a strong relationship with several tour operators, and it is a joint effort of the groups involved to produce that magazine. Well, the only difficulty there is that there is not one executive of your airline who can testify that he heard anything about flight at below 6,000 feet. Yes. Yet the airline itself was party to a million papers advertising that fact. Yes. Can you explain that? Thank you, Mr. Davis. You may step down. Silence. Stand up, please. Five months of hearings come to an end. 
Mann has been forced to ask the government for three extensions of time in order to hear over 50 witnesses, read three and a half thousand pages of evidence, study almost 300 exhibits. With the help of counsel, he's followed a highly technical trail of clues to a disaster in the most remote place on earth. As Mann looks forward to writing his report for Parliament and the conclusion of a long and demanding inquiry, he cannot know that his own trial is about to begin. In my opinion, therefore, the single dominant and effective cause of the disaster was a mistake made by those airline officials who programmed the aircraft to fly directly at Mount Erebus and omitted to tell the aircrew. That mistake is directly attributable, not so much to the persons who made it, but to the administrative, the incompetent administrative airline procedures which made the mistake possible. No judicial officer ever wishes to be compelled to say that he has listened to evidence which is false. He always prefers to say, as I hope the hundreds of judgments which I have written will illustrate, that he cannot accept the relevant explanation, or that he prefers a contrary version set out in the evidence. But in this case, the palpably false sections of evidence which I heard could not have been the result of mistake or faulty recollection. They originated, I am compelled to say, in a predetermined plan of deception. They were very clearly part of an attempt to conceal a series of disastrous administrative blunders. And so I am forced reluctantly to say that I had to listen to an orchestrated litany of lies. Man's a bloody bum. Mom's reports out. Listen. In my opinion, neither Captain Collins nor First Officer Casson nor the flight engineers made any error which contributed to the disaster. They were not responsible for its occurrence. Maria? Where did he get this stuff from? I don't quite understand how this could have happened. Lloyd, did Marl give you any indication that he was thinking along these lines? None. David? We felt that possibly he might have given more weight to some matters like coordinates than Chippendale did, but... You know. Richard? It's totally off the wall, sir. What? Unexpected, sir. There are very serious allegations in the report relating to the Chief Executive's integrity. The board totally rejects the Commission's findings. Will Mr. Davis be resigning? We have a lot of faith in Mr. Davis, and we want him to stay on. What about the coordinates? Thank you. Is the board going to and take any action? What's the story, Murray? Will you the conductor, Murray? Will you be resigning? Will you be paying 150 My professional competence and integrity have come under savage attack in the Erebus report. That attack is totally indefensible. I reject entirely any allegations that my performance of duties, giving of evidence or relationship to the giving of evidence by others was in any way inadequate or improper. What else could he say? But worse is to follow. The Director of Civil Aviation, Captain Kippenberger, refuses to accept Mann's finding that his division was also culpable. Civil aviation's role in the disaster was reviewed by a state services committee. My officers and I were harshly dealt with by the commissioner. One month later, this committee, comprising a former chief of defense staff and a senior civil servant, absolved civil aviation of any culpability, despite acknowledging what it called significant shortfalls by the division. So civil service absolving the civil service. The government can't just stand by and allow them to do this. What now, Mr. Attorney General? 
The next step would have to be a police investigation of possible criminal actions by employees of Air New Zealand, logically. Logically? Where is this bloody thing going to end? Hey? Well, I think we're obliged to put in trouble. You wanted a commission of inquiry. Then the State Services Commission. Now it's a police investigation. By the time this thing is finished, every man and his dog might as well have had a go at it. How many national flag carriers have we got, Jim? How many companies does this country send out into the world in a high-tech, high-profile industry who can say, we can do it, and better than most? What's the hell are doing here? Where's Jim? Where's Murray? Mr. Justice Mann's findings that there has been a litany of lies and, by implication, a cover-up are extravagant. These allegations were not put to those involved nor substantiated by the evidence. These are grave deficiencies, and the Board has instructed counsel to seek legal redress and to issue proceedings in the High Court to review and set aside these allegations. Has Mr. Davis anything to say? The following day, the Chairman of the Board, Bill Mace, and his deputy, Des Dalgetty, meet the Prime Minister in his office, after which Muldoon declares his hand. The future of Air New Zealand is a matter which must concern all New Zealanders. It is an airline of which we have been proud for 40 years. And of which we can still be proud. My own reading of the Mann Report tells me that these findings are not supported by any evidence set out in the report, what? but merely represent an opinion expressed by Mr. Justice Mann. It's unprecedented. The president of the Auckland Law Society, Mr. Ted Thomas, disagreed. It is accepted that the report of any inquiry is open to criticism. The lawyers are concerned that the opinions of Air New Zealand board member Mr. Des Delgetti and of the airline's senior counsel, Mr. Lloyd Brown, are being given equal weight to Mr. Justice Mann's conclusions. As an independent jurist, Mr. Justice Mann's credentials are without parallel. And the opposition spokesman on transport says he's critical of the Prime Minister. Well, you said at the beginning it was going to be a political football. I didn't expect this. I was appointed by the Governor-General on the recommendation of the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister has just abandoned me. For Mom, the die is cast. There will be an unprecedented review of his findings as Royal Commissioner. He is subverting the legal process. Should we simply step aside? I be circumspect, David. I shall make it clear that it is not a matter of personality. Muldoon wants a public brawl. He thrives on them. So, I'm to cower from the little man? Well, it's not just a question of Muldoon. If you go public, it'll put the judiciary in an awkward position. How? Oh. You know it's a cardinal sin for a judge to engage in a public debate over his own decision. Ah, but I was acting as a member of the executive, not the judiciary. With all due respect, sir, that is a legal fiction. You cannot afford to develop a public persona. Already you're guilty in the judge's eyes of using extravagant language. I have a vocabulary, for God's sake. Am I not to use it? Some of them consider you could have framed it in such a way so as not to offend. Offend? They lied to me and I call them for it. When I became a judge, David, I did not regard it as a vow of retreat from the real world. Nevertheless, sir, there are rules which... I will not deny as a judge what I know as a man. Sir, sir, you the Do you mind? Do you mind? Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. The Prime Minister's comments are interesting, but unsound. The evidence cannot possibly be understood without reference to thousands of pages of testimony and hundreds of exhibits. The PM says he hasn't read the evidence, Your Honor, but he says he trusts the opinions of those who have. Other than myself, obviously. Uh, the Prime Minister's confidence in some of his advisers is admirable. I can only suggest that he may find a due course that it has been sadly misplaced.
In May 1981, Air New Zealand grounds six executive pilots and transfers another six staff to unspecified duties, pending the completion of a police investigation. Executive pilots including Captains Eden, Grundy, Gemmell, Johnson and Hawkins, Messrs Hewitt, Lawton and Amys from Navigation Section, Briefing Officer Wilson and Flight Dispatch Officer Keeley. What about Maury Davis? I have nothing further to add. I don't understand what's changed. We have complete faith in Maury. We do. It's not a question of culpability, it's a question of identification. Murray's become identified in the public mind with Erebus. But we asked him to do that. We asked him to do all the media stuff. Nevertheless, Bill, it's gone bad on us. I have to think of the company. We have obligations to the shareholder. Is there something else we should know, Des? Well, it's obvious, I would have thought. We have to jettison. Murray understands. Murray? It's a hell of a way to go after 40 years. But it's not resignation, Murray. It's retirement. I don't give a damn what we call it, Diz. Still brands me. It is perhaps unfortunate that some will feel my departure from office is an admission on my part of some kind of failure or guilt. That is decidedly not so. My sole purpose in retiring is an attempt to remove a focus point from this current controversy and hasten the recovery of the company. For the first time in 40 years, Davis has no job to go to in the morning. Well, there you are. He will sit at home for the next six weeks waiting for a knock on the door from the police investigation team. The Commissioner of Police is directed by the Attorney General, Jim McClay, to investigate possible criminal actions by Air New Zealand personnel before and after the Erebus crash. Superintendent Brian Wilkinson divides the investigation into four main areas of possible criminal liability. Conspiracy, defeating the course of justice, perjury, manslaughter. Zed! is Davis. He is our ultimate goal. Why is Eden the director of flight operations? But we work on our way through to them, starting at A. A is Brian Hewitt, the chief navigator. I was on oath. I answered the questions as honestly as I could. I was responsible, and I said so. Exhibit 164. That exhibit shows a track down McMurdo sound right to the coordinates you say were a mistake. Yes. And it magically reappears in the pilot's briefing just after you make the mistake? Yes. In your evidence, you put that down to coincidence. I'd say better than that. It was a remarkable coincidence. It wasn't a coincidence. I shouldn't have said that it was. But it seems incredible to me that it should be used as a briefing document when it doesn't follow the correct route. Absolutely incredible. The whole thing is just amazing. Hewitt's direct superior, Ross Johnson, is next. Captain Simpson, in his evidence, says the briefing you told the commission you gave Collins and him, and the briefing you actually gave him, are completely different. Yes. Well, does that make you a liar, or would you call it intentional embroidery? I still think that what I said was correct. Which would make Simpson's testimony incorrect. I might have been mistaken. Or he might have been. Well, that certainly clears that up. Wilkinson concludes that the true extent of the change in 901's flight track was ignored because of Johnson's failure to notice the discrepancy between Simpson's 27 mile and Hewitt's 2.1 mile cross track distance. What do you think? If you agree with Mann that the coordinates mistake was the dominant cause. I do. I can't say Collins was absolutely blameless, but I can say any negligence by him was on a minor scale. Then Hewitt and Johnson have to be charged with manslaughter. Mm. Put it in writing. 
Yes, uh, yes, of course I'll tell her. Peter? Peter? Do you see him? Who? The two is back. Oh, where? He's gone. He gave him a start. Oh, you think you found me. David Baragwanath was on the phone. The Court of Appeals agreed to review me. Now, how did you know that? My brethren have all gone quiet. Not many of them are talking to me. Peter, what on earth is going on? I spoke out against the little corporal. He's been attacking the judiciary for years. I thought they'd be pleased. They shot poor chaps. Ah, Lloyd Brown. I wrote to Lloyd suggesting we resumed our lunches. Place the odd bet before the TAB's profits suffered irreparably. I do not consider that my being seen with you in public will be consistent with my representing my client company's best interest, which I continue to do. He might have rung. Ah, it's a good report, Peter. Thank you, sir. Set out a solid case for jointly charging Hewitt and Johnson with manslaughter. And I agree with you, in principle. In principle? Listen to this. Mine report. That mistake, that's the coordinates mistake, is directly attributable not so much to the persons who made it, but to the incompetent administrative airline procedures which made the mistake possible. I think he's just saved Johnson and Hewitt from manslaughter. I don't understand why 257 people should die and those two get off scot-free. The law says we cannot charge a company with manslaughter. If we can't charge a company, why should Johnson and Hewitt be made scapegoats? Johnson will retain his position with Air New Zealand and go on to become flight supervisor of training on 767s. Hewitt will never regain his job and will never again work as a navigator. Meanwhile, Detective Senior Sergeant Stan Keith is pursuing the question of perjury central to the orchestrated litany of lies finding in Mann's report. Captain Eden, in your evidence before the commission, you admitted to knowing about the change of coordinates on the 29th of November, the day after the crash. Now you say you didn't know until the 4th of December. Well, I couldn't recall the exact date, and I still can't. Well, why at the commission did you say the 29th? No, 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 I didn't. I said it was Tuesday. You were asked when you were told, and you answered. It may have been that morning, the morning after. Well, I thought about it, and I believe it wasn't until the next week. Amy's, Lawton, Hewitt and Johnson all knew the next morning. Well, I didn't. I assume that navigation section didn't realise the importance. I assume that Captain Johnson may have. I don't accept that. They fully realised on the night of the 28th. They got Hewitt out of bed twice. They rang him about a two degree, ten minute error. Oh no, they knew the night before. I'm more inclined to accept your evidence before the commission. I don't believe I was told until the following Tuesday. You see, I would have told Mr. Davis as soon as I knew. Was there an agreement between you and Davis to suppress information regarding the coordinates? Not as far as I was concerned. You see, I went on leave on the 15th of December, so there was no agreement as far as I was aware. Certainly a desire to uh, see that it didn't get out into the newspapers. The committee was told on the 11th, so there was no deliberate attempt to suppress. On the afternoon of the 5th of December, you called a briefing of the CBR transcribing team, Wyatt, Cooper and Olive, prior to their departure with the CVR tapes for America. Why did you not inform them of the change of coordinates? I don't think I was there. You were. If you had told them, would not this have assisted them in transcribing the tape? I don't know the answer to that at all. 
Why didn't you inform the CVR team of the change of coordinates? I didn't know they didn't know. I can't reconcile how you could let them go to the States without that knowledge. Seems extraordinary to you, but not to us. Eden will retain his position at Air New Zealand as Director of Flight Operations. Look at it. That's the oldest stainless trail I've ever clapped eyes on. I'm sure he knew on the 29th of November, the day after the crash. I agree. That 4th of December story just doesn't hold up. The question is, when did it get to Davis? Practically all flight ops and most of Davis' executives know about the change of the coordinates the morning after the crash. Eden says he didn't tell Davis till five days later. Well, I'll tell you what. If any of you withheld that sort of information from me, you wouldn't be working for me much longer. What about the knowledge of low flying? Brisenden writes an article in Travelling Times about flying to 3,000 feet. That article is reprinted in Air New Zealand News and is delivered to Davis's desk. What say he says he was off sick? The Travelling Times version was delivered to his letterbox at his house. So. We have here a situation in which Davis, as chief executive, seems not to know something about his own airline that every other person in New Zealand knows. Shall we go and see Davis? It's perjury. We need corroboration. We can't go and see Davis until we've got something to pin his ears back with. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time. <laughs> the news tonight, the police team investigating the Erebus irregularities draws a blank. Air New Zealand today announced the reinstatement of the 12 employees suspended during the police investigation into the alleged criminal wrongdoings thrown up by the Marne report. The police officer in charge of the investigation, Superintendent Brian Wilkinson, said that no charges would be instituted. The police investigation concludes that a strong inference can be drawn that senior executives were aware of the low flying being undertaken by their pilots in the Antarctic, but that sufficient corroborative evidence to substantiate charges of perjury cannot be gathered. There are similar difficulties in corroborating any perjury with regard to the knowledge of the change of coordinates. Six months after Mann's report is released, the Court of Appeal review is imminent. Under court order, Mann is able to obtain further documents from Air New Zealand. Among these are minutes of Air New Zealand's board meetings after the crash. They are a revelation. Davis told the board on the 5th of December that the DC-10 was off track considerably. Then later, he says, it appeared to be left of center. Which means even he understood the track to be down the sound. We could have roasted him. Why did you tell your directors that the impact position was off track? Oh. Is it not Shh. a fact that official or not, the accepted flight path was down McMurdo Sound? And that all pilots in 1978 and 1979 were briefed to fly down the sound? How do you account for your executive pilots having told the commission that the official and only flight path was over Mount Erebus? Damn, damn, damn! You'll have to watch the attraction of alliteration, Gary. Seems to have done me no good. We consistently asked Air New Zealand for all files and records and got truckloads of rubbish. Why were these minutes not produced to us during the commission? The Air New Zealand Company secretary said he was given to understand our order for discovery included only documents up to the date of the crash. And I wonder who would have given him to understand that. Words fail me. Later in the minutes of the 5th of December board meeting, Davis assures the board that all the navigation systems were functional. He didn't tell them that an error had lain in the computer for 14 months and had only been corrected the night before. And that Collins hadn't been told about it. In his evidence, Eden said that he knew about the two-degree error in coordinates on the 29th. Davis surely must have known about them by the 5th of December. The bitter irony for Mann is that because the minutes were not produced in evidence before him at the commission, 
he cannot use them or rely on them in any way in the Court of Appeal. For the appeal hearings in Wellington, Mann chooses an old friend, George Barton, to be his counsel. Air New Zealand will attack me, George, under the rules of natural justice. <laughs> They've got a nerve. Your decisions have helped define the principles of natural justice here. They are in this burge and the longer this blessed thing goes on. What do you want me to do? I have decided not to attend the hearing, George. Oh? I have no stomach for watching my brethren shift from cheek to cheek and pronounce judgment upon me. I want you to be my eyes and ears in there. Very well. Where can I reach you? There's a beautiful forest, George, quite unlike Dante's. There I shall wander, Heather and John, observing the rules of natural justice. <laughs> In the Court of Appeal, there is a preliminary battle which foreshadows the final decision. The President is Sir Owen Woodhouse. Mr. Brown, you had a submission. Yes, sir, there is one preliminary matter. My learned colleagues, Mr. Baraguanov and Mr. Harrison, do not appear to be representing any party to the inquiry. I submit that they have no status to appear in these proceedings. Oh, Mr. Baraguanov, what have you to say in answer to Mr. Brown? Your Honor, we are representing the Attorney General. Yes, but why? The public interest must be represented, sir. And uh, what is the public interest, Mr. Paraguanath? That the court be fully informed, sir. Your Honor, it is surely necessary that someone in these proceedings is able to put a contrary view to that of Air New Zealand. And you do not then intend to adopt a neutral role? No, sir. And what have you to say in answer to that, Mr. Brown? Your Honour, I'm simply afraid that the Attorney General's role in these proceedings will become confused with Mr. Justice Marnes. And I fail to see how that confusion benefits the public interest. Delay it. Neither do I. Get the Sister General down here. Lloyd! What can I do for you, George? For heaven's sake, Lloyd, what are you trying on with Woodhouse? Do you really want the whole game to yourselves? <laughs> My dear George, it's merely a small preliminary legal joust. Oh, rubbish. The rest of us are in no position to provide you with real opposition. If Bags and Harrison get thrown out, it won't be a joust, it'll be a walkover. Where's your client, George? Now, there's a man fond of the joust, I would have thought, or at least of white chargers. Let's keep the personal out of it. Yes, let's. He savaged my client company, George. What would you suggest I do? Represent your client company to the best of your ability, Lloyd, and allow the other view to be put. That's the nature of our system of justice, surely. Yes, well, let's see what their honours have to say, shall we? It is not until the Solicitor General intervenes that the Court of Appeal accepts the presence of Baraguanath and Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Nazar. Very well, Mr. Baraguanath, you may stay. Such a small country, Sam, yet there can be no grander perspective than this in all the world. We're quite remote, aren't we? Here, from the agencies of man and state. Oh, you're not alone, Dad. As far as the public is concerned, you're a hero. I've always been a discreet man of the establishment, Sam. Unlike yourself. Now you're a man of the people. In the eyes of the establishment, that simply confirms my decline. Then fight them, Dad. Go down with six guns blazing. I never really thought it was that kind of country. Good evening. The Court of Appeal has this evening released its judgment 
on the review of Mr. Justice Mahon's report on the Erebus disaster. The majority decision was that in making allegations of a predetermined plan of deception and of an Orchestrated orchestrated litany of lies lies against Air New Zealand management, Mr. Justice Mahon had exceeded his jurisdiction as Royal Commissioner. The Court of Appeal said that although a Royal Commissioner was permitted to comment on the credibility of witnesses, he wasn't empowered to make what amounted to allegations of criminal conduct against them. The Court went on to say that even if Mr. Justice Mahon did have the power to make such allegations, he was obliged by the rules of natural justice to put such allegations plainly to the witnesses affected. The court found that Mr Justice Mann had not done so and quashed the Commission's order for costs against the airline. The Court of Appeal stressed that its decision doesn't in any way affect the Commissioner's findings as to the causes of the disaster. Rubbish. The manner in which Mr Justice Mann conducted his inquiry has been damned forever by the Court of Appeal. Mann's report should now attract the contempt of all fair-minded people. One would hope his irresponsible rhetoric will haunt him for the rest of his life. His unfounded and unfair findings against me personally lead me to comment that perhaps the only honourable course left to him is to resign. You're overreacting, Peter. The Court of Appeal judgment criticises a dozen paragraphs out of 400 in your report. It doesn't upset in any way your findings as to the cause of the disaster. I'm not talking about the majority decision. I'm talking about Woodhouse and McMullen. They got a great things to say. I had no evidence for some of the findings that I made. It's unprecedented, George. But it's only Woodhouse and McMullen who say that. Two judges out of five. There couldn't be a more stringent criticism of a judge. No judge in the history of this country has been placed in this position. But it's a minority decision, Peter. It has no formal standing. George, it is a public pronouncement by two of my peers that I, as a judge, am unable to determine whether what I am told is truth or lies. And I should answer them publicly. I have offered to resign in protest at the minority decision of the Court of Appeal. The effect of that judgment is simply to reflect the thinking of the management of Air New Zealand. I think it's a great pity that Mr. Justice Mann has spoken out in public on this issue. You never see a judge of the High Court getting into a public argument over the fact that the Court of Appeal has overturned one of his judgments. The Prime Minister is completely confused about the situation. My report was not a High Court judgment. A Royal Commissioner could be anyone, any person at all, not necessarily a High Court judge. In the Court of Appeal case, I was an ordinary litigant. I have the right of every litigant to disagree with the court's decision. (laughs) Mr. Justice Mann should put up or shut up. Specifically, he should say who orchestrated the lies and who told the lies and give his evidence to support both contentions. I would be only too willing to meet Mr. Muldoon's challenge if he would reconvene the Commission. Now, what he appears to be saying is that he will name names, provided that if he defames someone, he's not held responsible. (laughs) A bombshell has burst on the Mount Erebus Court of Appeal decision. It's been revealed today that two judges responsible for the minority decision of the Court of Appeal have family ties with Air New Zealand. President of the Court of Appeal, Sir Owen Woodhouse, has a daughter who is a public relations officer for Air New Zealand. It's also reported that Mr. Justice McMullen's son is a pilot for Air New Zealand. It was further alleged that Richard McGrain, junior counsel for Air New Zealand, is a close friend of the McMullen family and visited the McMullen home on occasions during the commission hearings. In the tight, insular circle of the Auckland judiciary, none of this is news to man. But the public exposure of the judges he holds responsible for his resignation comes too late. Mann is already committed on a matter of principle to a course which will finish his judicial career. As Attorney General, you should appeal to the Privy Council on my behalf 
on the grounds of the judge's bias. I want no part in any appeal. If you yourself want to appeal to the Privy Council, that's up to you. <laughs> Minister, I have the resources to fund an appeal to the Privy Council and you know it. The government will fund you. Providing we can get your pension sorted out. Strictly speaking, you're not entitled to a pension. Well, I appreciate that. I thought under the circumstances I'd get at least some of it. As it happens, the Cabinet is prepared to be generous. <laughs> but we can't live on that. I'd be working as well, of course. There'd be arbitrations. Oh, Peter, you are assuming good health and ability to work. Don't worry, Mother. But Margarita's fears are realised. Mann is given to understand there is a position for him at the University of Canterbury. He sells his Auckland home and he and Margarita set up house in Christchurch in anticipation. It never materialises. He applies for a part-time position at Lincoln College, just outside Christchurch. The position goes to someone else. The stress begins to tell. He is weakened by influenza and develops a viral heart condition as he battles with the government over who will represent him in his appeal to the Privy Council. As Attorney General, I'll be taking a strictly neutral stance in the hearings. The government cannot be seen to be supporting your appeal. <laughs> well, surely the government cannot be seen to be undermining it either. If I cannot have Baraguanath and Harrison, my appeal will be compromised. And New Zealand and Davis will have Lloyd Brown and Williams who have the benefit of long-standing involvement with the case. I'm asking for the same benefit. I'll see what I can do. The government finally allows Baraguanath to represent Mann. Almost four years after the disaster on Erebus, the Privy Council hearings begin. Sir Patrick Neal, a London barrister, appears with Baraguanath for Marne. Robert Alexander and Lloyd Brown for Air New Zealand. Marne himself is unable to attend due to ill health. We are saying that the conspiracy on low flying started from the time Mr Chippendale was told by Air New Zealand that there were fixed minimum safe altitudes of 16,000 feet and 6,000 feet, depending on where the aircraft was. Mm. Mr. Mann mm. never put to Mr. Davis that he had organized a cover-up. Except possibly some very slight inference in relation to low flying. When questioned by Mr. Mann, Mr. Davis could suggest no reasonable explanation as to why management was unaware of flights below 6,000 feet when his company had seen fit to print one million copies of an article which established just that fact. My lord, it would be hard to find an issue which was more squarely out on the table than whether Air New Zealand witnesses were telling lies about their knowledge of low flying. Despite Maclay's assurances that the government does not want to take sides, counsel for the Attorney General finally declares the government's hand. With respect, your lordships, the New Zealand Court of Appeal is inevitably better placed than are your lordships to make an assessment of what the reasonable New Zealand reader would make of Mr. Mann's report. And accordingly, the Attorney General submits that the Court of Appeal's assessment should be given very great weight. It would only be appropriate for your Lordships to differ from it if you're quite satisfied that it is manifestly wrong. Their Lordships desire to place on record their tribute to the brilliant and painstaking investigative work undertaken by Mr. Justice Mahon. But notwithstanding, their Lordship's own impression of the report has coincided with that of the Court of Appeal. Although the Privy Council praised Mahon for his findings as to the cause of the disaster, his appeal is dismissed. The Air New Zealand management is cleared of organised perjury and the Privy Council makes an extraordinary finding in relation to executive knowledge of low flying. 
while their lordships accept that there was probative material before the judge from which he is entitled to draw the inference that at least some of the executive pilots had given false evidence in respect of her knowledge of low flying. Nevertheless, after the conclusion of the evidence, it became apparent that official tolerance of low flying was in no way causative of the accident. But when the executive pilots were giving evidence, the causes of the crash still remained undetermined. And it is an understandable weakness on the part, part of individual of members of the airline management that they should shrink from acknowledging, even to themselves, that something that they had done or failed to do might have been a cause of so horrendous a disaster. Nope. I've read it three times, and for the life of me, I still cannot understand what he is saying. The man is simply saying, one, that my analysis of the cause of the accident is brilliant and correct. Two, that my analysis of the cause of the accident is incorrect, insofar as I give any weight to executive knowledge of low flying. Three, that the executives might well have been lying about their knowledge of low flying. Four, that that doesn't matter because their lordships don't think that had anything to do with the cause of the disaster. Five, that because at the time they lied, the executives thought low flying was a possible cause of the disaster. It was quite understandable for them to want to lie. Ah, oh, Peter. What can we do? Where the instrument of thinking mind is joined to strength and to malice, man's defense cannot avail to meet those powers combined. Man is offered part-time work at the University of Auckland. It is the beginning of a new post erebus life in an environment Man enjoys. Thank you, Gary. Dear Lloyd, I received your note declining my invitation to lunch. I regret that you consider a luncheon with me to be incompatible to your continuing representation of your client company's best interests. You will, of course, appreciate that in adopting the course I did, I was obliged to keep uppermost in my mind not the best interests of your client company, nor the best interests of the Department of Civil Aviation, nor the government, nor indeed the interests of the Airline Pilots Association or the consortium or any of the other interests tangibly represented at the hearings. Uppermost in my mind at all times was my obligation to represent the interests of 257 men and women who perished in a disaster which might have been avoided. If my actions in that respect have embarrassed you and compromised our friendship, it is clear to me now that the value I always attributed to that friendship was false. Morning, lads. Your Honour. How's tricks? Bowling along, Your Honour. You're looking extra curly yourself. <laughs> You're a better judge of horses, lads. I hope the weights aren't getting to you. Aged stare. Almost weighted out by the handicapper, Lance. You know the true stayers, Your Honor. They only come through with a bit of age. I should have taken up your offer, Lance. Spotting nags for the tipster's rag. I'd have enjoyed that. Up at dawn with the dew and the mist. A stopwatch in hand. 
the thump of hooves on wet grass, the snort of a clean-winded coat. <laughs> I think sometimes it's been a bit of a waste. the 11th of August, 1986, Peter Mann died of heart failure. For my purposes, the most definitive illustration of the hidden perils of the Antarctic was the wreckage which lay on the mountainside below me, showing how the forces of nature, if given the chance, can sometimes defeat the flawless technology of man. For the ultimate key to the tragedy lay here, in the white silence of Erebus, the place to which the airliner had been unerringly guided by its microelectronic navigation system, only to be destroyed in clear air and without warning by a malevolent trick of the polar light. In our ABC special next Wednesday, we premiere Game, Set and Match, a preview in a moment, then an insight into the one of the world's greatest